All right, this is Stephen Sloan. The date is May 31st, 2012. I'm with Mr. Herb Stern at his address, 12427 Old Oaks Drive in Houston, Texas. Uh, this is an interview for the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission's uh, Texas Liberators Project. Thank you, Mr. Stern, for sitting down with me well, today. Thank you. I appreciate uh, your uh, doing this because I feel uh, it is so important uh, uh, since so many survivors, either Holocaust survivors or people like myself, uh, feel that uh, we are at the end of our lives and uh, possibly in another few years there are no so-called eyewitnesses uh, that uh, uh, have been through all this. And uh, since you're talking about uh, uh, of the, the Holocaust uh, in itself, over six million people uh, that uh, uh, died in one form or another, uh, plus uh, the huge casualties during World War II, that I think it's so important for young, a younger generation or younger generations to at least have some knowledge uh, that uh, in past many years prior to all this, uh, World War I, Civil War, whatever uh, other wars that you've had, uh, that uh, you have the benefit of uh, a lot more detailed recordings mm -hmm. uh, of, for, for history that uh, were not to that extent available. Uh, I've studied a lot of, about the Civil War. I mean, I'm not exactly a Civil War buff, but I've, I've had the opportunity uh, to uh, study it a great deal. I was uh, minored in history and uh, majored in economics in, in college and uh, uh, continued to be interested uh, to a great extent in world history. So I feel that uh, the uh, uh, anything that we do in publicizing uh, that period, which was so traumatic uh, in the 30s and 40s and even into the 50s, mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, uh, I hope, of a great deal of benefit for future generations. And I think uh, that, uh, you know, we never thought <laughs> as we were in these situations that it was anything of that importance because you never think in terms of history until many years later. Then you begin to think, especially if you're in your 90s, you think, my God, all the things that I have had in my life hmm. of uh, major and minor consequences uh, that uh, throughout it and had uh, basically several changes uh, of major consequences in my own life and I feel that uh, having been uh, for four years in a situation in, uh, in eight major campaigns uh, in Europe that this is a major watershed in my life obviously. So I feel that uh, uh, it, and being able to uh, present these things to not only my family, but to uh, uh, whether it's colleges or uh, or even even the Holocaust museums uh, when they have exhibitions and things like that. Uh, we've had uh, the Houston Holocaust Museum recently had a. Uh, back in July of, this, uh, uh, of last year, uh, a traveling exhibit of, uh, uh, for some strange reason, publicists uh, 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 had commented uh, that uh, there were no such things as Jewish soldiers in World War II, that they were not allowed to serve in any capacity whatsoever. Uh, at least it was inferred that that was happening. And uh, I contacted the Holocaust Museum and said that this is uh, obviously somebody is very paranoid 
uh, about this because it was uh, this exhibit tried to prove uh, that uh, 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 Jewish-born uh, men were just as active as anybody else in all the services. Uh, we had our share uh, in our own division, and uh, anybody that uh, has ever seen uh, overseas uh, cemeteries will see that uh, the Star of David is on many graves uh, just as much as anybody else's. So that uh, that's just a myth, unfortunately, that somebody concocted uh, and for what reason, I don't know. But I have to mention that because it, it's upset me a good deal because it is, uh, especially when you, the first thing comes to your mind, uh, does anybody remember there was a draft? Yeah. Uh, and the draft didn't take into account that you had to be of a certain age between age so and so and so and so and, and, and that meant you were drafted, period. That was the law of the land. And uh, uh, if then you were, uh, people were sifted out, uh, well, that uh, uh, came as, as you went on. Uh, now, should I continue with my well, background of history? That's good. You know, we before we began recording, I asked you to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. some of your early memories mm -hmm. about your family in yeah. Germany. And if you could share that now, that would be great. All right. I wanted to uh, mention uh, that uh, uh, I had, uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, probably in 1934, possibly before my father was uh, imprisoned, uh, that he instituted with uh, uh, distant cousins in this country the possibility of getting me out of Germany. Because uh, had I stayed there, the inevitable would have been, just as has happened to many of my families uh, and close friends, uh, that uh, uh, we would have ended up either in Auschwitz or somewhere else because many of my people, my, one of my grandmothers, my, my mother's mother uh, was one of them, uh, and numerous friends that I went to school with who had actually uh, moved to France to escape the Germans and of course were caught later on, uh, so that uh, uh, almost everybody that I grew up with uh, was gone. and. Uh, uh, I think we were very fortunate. Uh, it took two and a half years for me to get a visa. Uh, we were caught up in a situation that is uh, not a myth, but certainly well recorded, that the uh, State Department, particularly of the, the uh, American State Department and the Roosevelt administration, uh, had uh, a number of rather influential anti-Semites in there, and one or two set up a very small quota of people that could immigrate. Uh, there are many specific situations that uh, uh, one of them particularly was just this last weekend, we were talking about it at my, my daughter's house in Austin, uh, that uh, uh, the infamous uh, German liner, the St. Louis, uh, had uh, uh, several hundred Germans, German-Jewish refugees that were uh, taken first to Cuba. The Cubans wouldn't take them. Uh, they were trying to get into uh, Florida and Miami. They wouldn't take them. Eventually the ship was taken ba ba back to where they were eventually imprisoned and many of them died. Uh, in and concentration camps. Uh, I myself, the reason I'm mentioning that particular incident, uh, prior to all this happening in 1936, in August of 1936, uh, I came over on the St. Louis. In August of 35? 36. 36. 36. Okay. I arrived in this country on August 26th, 1936, to New York. Uh, and uh, was met uh, by a 
you might say, distant relative, my uncle and his wife uh, in New York and stayed with them for about a week uh, at that particular time. But uh, uh, talk about sweating it out. Uh, I was staying with my father's closest friend who was an attorney. His entire family died at Auschwitz. Uh, and uh, my sister, uh, when the Germans marched into the Sudetenland uh, of Czechoslovakia, uh, they uh, fled to Prague and uh, uh, my aunt and her family uh, first uh, were taken to, uh, uh, flew to Italy temporarily and then to England. And my sister was on the last plane out of Prague before the Germans marched in and by that time uh, oh, my, I, I should also mention that uh, uh, two days before I sailed to, for the United States, uh, my father was released. So I was with him uh, and his friends for two days, and then he took me uh, to uh, Hamburg, and uh, from Hamburg to uh, outside of Hamburg, Bremerhaven uh, is the, the uh, actually where uh, you leave from there for uh, for uh, overseas uh, at the time. So uh, and uh, uh, he a few days after that fled to England. Uh, my father eventually became an English citizen. He remarried uh, a German woman that uh, I vaguely knew while he was in prison uh, at the time. They were, for a short time during the beginning of uh, the war, were interned before they got English citizenship papers. He was very fortunate to have close friends in a major Lloyd's underwriting firm and so remained in, in England and uh, did <coughs> fairly well considering that he really had lost everything, everything. And my sister then moved uh, uh, in with him after she fled from Prague, Czechoslovakia. Uh, and uh, uh, during the Blitz in London and so on, she was one of the young people who was sent to the country. Uh, she was sent to a small farm family where she became a babysitter for uh, a, a, an, inf an infant for a while. Eventually moved back to London, uh, got a job uh, at a uh, well-known hairdresser, and uh, lo and behold, uh, in 19, early 1943, uh, she met a Texan, uh, just by coincidence, uh, you might say almost at a street corner in Hyde Park, uh, London, and uh, he was on Eisenhower's staff, uh, and she eventually became a war bride and moved over here in 1946 and moved to Austin where the family lived uh, at, at that time. And uh, uh, the last time I had seen my sister was in 1932, and we were re reunited. Of course, I was working uh, out of Cincinnati, Ohio, and eventually was transferred down here in 1949 by my company. Uh, that uh, and we had a district office here that was virtually non-functioning since World War II, uh, and I took this whole Southwest region over uh, at that time. So we were moved down here, and uh, uh, eventually, I mean, it's. A, really an unbelievable story that we were re reunited of all things here in Houston. She still lives in Houston. Uh, she will be 90 years old uh, uh, in December and uh, she has four children uh, here that uh, all in their 60s nowadays. <laughs> uh, and so uh, and we do see each other uh, fairly frequently. Uh, and uh, uh, I saw my father for the first time in December of 1943 uh, because uh, we were one of two 
divisions that uh, were supposed to go into Italy from Sicily uh, in uh, uh, the late fall of 1943, uh, and all of a sudden they uh, shipped us to England because we were had combat experience and we were to train newly arriving divisions that were going to eventually be in the Normandy invasion. And uh, while I was in England, uh, I was sent to uh, uh, <coughs> British Intelligence School for two weeks in London, and uh, it was an eye-opener because uh, I learned so much more than uh, uh, what we were guinea pigs for in North Africa and Sicily. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I was in the medics uh, when uh, I came to the 9th Infantry Division at Fort Bragg, North Carolina in the late summer, or I guess it was August, something like that, of 1941. And uh, uh, after a few weeks uh, in the 9th Infantry Division, all of a sudden they announced that a specific number of what we called cadres, uh, out of each company in the division, of all units, uh, were taken out to form a brand new division, which turned out to be the 82nd Airborne Division uh, at Fort Bragg. And uh, uh, I can recall that uh, in the summer of 1942, most of us were shipped to the Chesapeake Bay to uh, get involved in amphibious maneuvers. Mm. And uh, uh, that we were destined to go overseas. Many of us had no idea whether it was the Pacific or, uh, or Europe or where we, certainly one of the things we never thought of is that we would go into Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, uh, the uh, uh, in, in um, uh, mid-October uh, of 1942, uh, we were taken to Norfolk and uh, we were in a convoy of about a hundred ships. Uh, and uh, I was very fortunate uh, to be on the Commodore ship, uh, which was very much protected because most the convoy was being highly protected by rigid destroyers and and uh, uh, and cruisers uh, throughout the journey uh, because of the uh, activity of German U-boats uh, during that period of time. So we were at sea almost uh, three weeks, four, almost four weeks before they told us that we would be landing uh, on the French Moroccan coast in an amphibious landing. And uh, uh, that meant you went over, over on nets over the boat and then uh, into these little uh, PT boats. Mm -hmm. so, so, uh, little, uh, right, I want to I want to pick up there, but you uh, there's a lot I want to ask questions about that, right. that you've already put yeah. forward there. Um, if if you could go back and talk about because we didn't get it on the recording some of your earliest memory and the story of your family there in Germany. So, okay. so prior to 32, yeah. yeah. Well, it, uh, I, uh, uh, of course, attended uh, uh, both what you would call a classical uh, gymnasium, which meant that you were taught, among other things, Latin and Greek, but, uh, mostly Latin, and, um, uh, but also other languages were French, uh, and uh, uh, I learned that after I was actually no longer allowed to go to school, uh, that uh, uh, one of the teachers actually started teaching some English uh, at that time. Uh, but I had, other than that my father, I would overhear business conversations and uh, uh, read some business letters that he would write. Uh, that he spoke uh, almost fluent English, and his English was really what I would call Oxford English. I mean, it was it was uh, a uh, uh, and I think I learned a great deal. Now, uh, 
My maternal grandmother, uh, I hadn't mentioned this, uh, was actually born in New York. Uh, she, and this was a coincidence because her father was a tobacco importer and he would spend uh, six, eight months in the United States, mostly New York, uh, in trading capacity, in t tobacco trading and stuff like that. They lived in Hamburg when she grew up, but she was just born there. So she spoke American English, but again, uh, not really knowing at the time that I would ever end up in this country, uh, I just picked up on it. My wife always says that uh, that uh, uh, not on her family side, but my family side, that we have an ear for languages and for music. Uh, and uh, one of my sons uh, in Kansas is perfect pitch, uh, and he. Uh, I mean, this is more like a hobby, but he plays in uh, his. Uh, Topeka is where he lives and plays in the symphony, he plays first trumpet in the symphony. Uh, and uh, uh, Charlie, my son in Waco, is, uh, is, uh, plays trumpet in the, in the jazz orchestra, the uh, Waco Jazz Orchestra, and has for years. I mean, he's doing it for fun, but he, he feels it's a real release or not let for him to do so. Uh, and I think this is probably picking up a language and speaking it. Uh, uh, I cannot tell you, I don't know really why, that so many people that were my contemporaries who uh, left uh, Germany for English-speaking countries, uh, that you can tell the minute they open their mouths that they are uh, you know, from either from Germany or from another country. Uh, and um, uh, TH is a, is, is a terrible situation for most people because they can't pronounce the V. Of, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's that way. I have some people here in, in Houston that, uh, I mean, really, I have a cousin in New York. Uh, you can tell immediately they, they have a very strong German accent. They can speak English pr pretty well, but they uh, anyway, uh, getting back to uh, that period of time, I uh, was able to go to school uh, till what we would call the 11th grade, maybe like a junior. And at that time, uh, uh, anybody that was of Jewish descent was no longer able to uh, allowed in, in any school. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I mentioned uh, that uh, for our family, uh, the complete breakup came in 1933. Uh, my mother had committed suicide. Uh, uh, I think you had uh, actually a number of people in Germany that are different ages who uh, just felt that there was no, no way out to anywhere. Uh, to do anything. And I think my father, I, at least I don't believe that he ever thought of leaving Germany uh, at that time. Uh, but uh, then he was imprisoned in 1934 uh, because the Germans had started uh, a, um, one of the early laws uh, that they had started was you cannot take German marks out of the country. And uh, since he was given money to buy foreign passports uh, in various countries hope, uh, with the idea that the people that would receive them, receive these foreign passports, would have uh, some semblance of, of uh, protection uh, from the Nazis. Uh, it was a myth, but uh, at least at that time nobody thought about it in any other way. And uh, uh, his phone line was tapped. Uh, by the uh, German secret police, the Gestapo, uh, and uh, uh, so he was taken off a train going to Switzerland at the time uh, and uh, imprisoned. Uh, our uh, uh, belongings, all of our belongings were uh, 
auctioned off in order to raise uh, sufficient money, primarily to uh, find a defender for him, an attorney, a former district attorney, who was quite prominent in these civil situations at that time, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, get him as light a sentence as possible. And he received a two-year sentence in uh, uh, a prison that was uh, fairly, you might say, civil <laughs> in, in, in those days. And I was allowed to see him every six months for an hour uh, during that period of time. And it took me uh, about two hours to travel to, uh, to, uh, to see him and then, you know, to see him for about an hour. And uh, uh, <coughs> he was able to get out uh, two days before I sailed. Mm -hmm. uh, I sweated out living with two, three people, centered around my sister was living or uh, was moved to uh, Czechoslovakia to live with uh, my mother's sister and her family uh, there. And she went to a convent school uh, while she was there at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, my father, after he saw me off, spent two more days in Germany uh, with family and then escaped to England. Uh, and of course, he had uh, all the help that he could get from people that he'd done business with who were close, not only business friends, but personal friends of his. So he was able to take up his whole life all over again. But uh, he was then in his late 40s or, or early 50s, I don't really remember exactly, but it must have been in the late 40s. He was interned for a short period of time when England went to war with Germany. Uh, but uh, uh, other than that, uh, he uh, uh, did quite well and remarried. Uh, and uh, uh, as I mentioned before, I saw him uh, in first time again uh, after 1936, in August 1936. I saw him for the first time in December of 1943. Uh, when we were we were stationed in the south of England uh, around Winchester, uh, and uh, uh, I would have furloughs uh, every few weeks, uh, and uh, took the train up to see him, uh, to see them, and stayed with them. And uh, I have to tell you one very funny story. They were nervous wrecks d during during the. Uh, uh, blitz, uh, because their apartment, or flat as they call them, uh, was near what they call the Hempstead Heath uh, in uh, London, and that was the major concentration of aircraft uh, or anti-aircraft uh, guns around that area. So when in the middle of the night when those things went off, everybody took their ready-made bedding and went down to the tube, the, the subway and stayed there during the rest of the night. I remember staying with them, uh, and this was the first time in two years that I slept in a bed. And I put a pillow over my head while they went off and said, he turned around and went back to sleep. So <laughs> it didn't bother me that much. Anyway, uh, so I had, and then when I went, was assigned to work with British Intelligence School for two weeks, uh, I probably was the only American soldier ever that stayed with his family in London <laughs> instead of being billeted by an American, uh, in American uh, facilities uh, at that time. And I was actually taking the bus every, every morning to work and back at the, in the evening. So it was really a lot of fun. And uh, uh, we... Uh, Going back, uh, I mentioned uh, before that my sister and uh, family she was with, uh, which was my aunt and uncle, uh, they fled first to Prague when the Germans marched into uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, and uh, uh, they, 
that family fled to Italy and then to England. Uh, and my sister was on the very last plane out of Prague uh, to fly to, to London. Uh, and from there she was taken shortly after she got there during the Blitz, along with a lot of other young people, were taken into the country and she was became a babysitter on a farm mm -hmm. uh, that uh, for, for a while. Uh, and then she moved back to London uh, about a year later or something like that. Anyway, uh, uh, she married an American, uh, a Texan, uh, in London. They had met. He was on Eisenhower's staff, and uh, uh, and uh, they married. Actually, uh, the night I arrived in Liverpool from Sicily, uh, it was Thanksgiving night of 1943. Uh, we arrived, and I've learned later on that they had been married that day. Uh, and uh, uh, so they lived uh, in London for a while, uh, and he was eventually taken back to the United States so, uh, towards the end of the war. And she was able to come over with a bunch of war brides uh, uh, in 1946. And I was the one to, to meet her in New York uh, and then put her on a train to come to Texas. Uh, here she lived in Austin for a while uh, and uh, eventually she had four children uh, and uh, they uh, uh, eventually came to to Houston uh, because he became a, uh, uh, I think, a financial manager for a number of Sears stores, mm. Sears Roebuck stores mm. here in Houston. Uh, in the meantime, I uh, 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 after I uh, well, I, I moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, because a number of my father's relatives uh, lived there. Uh, most of the families that came over in the 1840s uh, were. Uh, great uncles of my father, mm. and uh, uh, they uh, all became uh, almost immediately involved in tobacco manufacturing, uh, and they were pretty good at it. Uh, they have three brothers uh, that were in there. One was a teenager, two others were in their early twenties, uh, moved to uh, a upstate New York uh, town of Saugerties in Kingston County. And uh, uh, only one remained in Saugerties, eventually became the mayor there and became a prominent citizen. Um, and uh, they were all uh, financially did very well in, in the tobacco business, manufacturing business. And one interesting aspect is that uh, uh, the youngest one who started the factory had about 12 workers for him, working for him. And uh, uh, they uh, had a strike. Uh, the workers had a strike because uh, my relative uh, didn't want to use any heat in the, in the factory during the winter time. So, uh, they started a strike, and the guy that started the strike was a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Gompers. He was also uh, a uh, actually uh, a, an English Jewish family that moved to New York, also in the tobacco business. But he didn't want to stay with his parents, so he moved to Socrates and became a labor, labor organizer. <laughs> Later on, became head of the AFL-CIO. So. Uh, that's part of the history. Uh, the, uh, they had, in turn, had several children. The, the young man there and made his fame and fortune eventually moved to Cincinnati after he uh, became quite well-to-do. Uh, his older brother had moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, and the oldest one uh, moved to Chicago at first. As, again, all, all his very young men. Uh, and. Uh, 
then he decided to move to a place called Freeport, Illinois, which was a, at that time an Indian trading post. Mm -hmm. And uh, he eventually became also quite wealth, wealthy in the, in the tobacco business, then became a banker and uh, uh, started a bank in there. He was head of the school board and uh, so on. I have done a lot of genealogy research on, on my families, on my father's side, and uh, therefore I'll go back all the way to the 1750s uh, in Germany. Uh, and eventually, uh, as I say, uh, six brothers in the 1840s, uh, three of them moved to the United States, three of them stayed. My great-grandfather remained. Uh, was one of three that remained there. Uh, he was in the textile business, did very well, eventually sold his textile business, and moved to Berlin from uh, a province of Pomerania, which was the breadbasket of Prussia or Germany for that matter, because it was uh, uh, absolutely tremendously well organized farms, of farmland, uh, and uh, I studied a lot of work through, uh, found a, uh, an organization in uh, uh, Germantown, Wisconsin called the Pomeranian Society, became a member just to get historical data and facts and uh, uh, met some people here in Wichita, Kansas that uh, uh, were from the same town as all of my relatives were from mm -hmm. and uh, got a treasure trove of materials uh, from them, other than going through libraries and all kinds of other sources to get information on a family that I knew nothing about as I grew up. Mm -hmm. Nothing. I didn't even know they existed. So they were very, very, uh, my, the people that took me in was really a second cousin of my father's. Mm -hmm. And she became really a surrogate mother for me and uh, was uh, a uh, highly intelligent woman uh, and I think taught me a great deal from the standpoint of language, writing, and so on. Can you, can you talk about your transition to the, because we talked about earlier these culture shocks. And well, uh, I will tell you one thing. I was amazed to find myself uh, joining the uh, college newspaper and became editor of the paper after I was on it for almost three years. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, uh, <laughs> among other things, I can remember getting into trouble with, uh, uh, in writing an editorial uh, one time. Uh, Cincinnati had a very uh, uh, large Catholic population and uh, old German town uh, uh, in, uh, uh, they had a good deal of influence on a, uh, actually a municipal college, which the University of Cincinnati was. And I wrote an editorial that I think they felt, uh, they thought was a little bit too nasty. So <laughs> I was, uh, I now, had to, do you, I had do you remember to, what your editorial was on? Yes, it was basically, uh, mentioning that the college president was in the pocket of the, the local bishop. And uh, uh, I mean, this is in a very abbreviated way of putting it, but, uh, and uh, I was called to, to, the, uh, to the board of trustees and said, uh, you know, uh, you can write editorials about the trustees and here and there they don't mind because they were mostly big corporate people in the, in the community, and they didn't mind that, but uh, uh, it came a little bit too close to, apparently, to, to, <laughs> to, to, I mean, it's sort of like my, my, my writing <laughs> a few nasty things that I can think about, Kenneth Starr, something like that. <laughs> so anyway, it, uh, no, I, uh, 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 but I enjoyed writing. At the time, it didn't mean anything really to me other than, you know, it helped me with my language and writing papers, uh, you know, in various, uh, especially in economics. And, uh, uh, but I found that I uh, 
like writing. Uh, I had, uh, in freshman English, I was so lucky to have a absolutely wonderful professor that really inspired you. And uh, uh, it, uh, uh, and he, you know, referred me to a lot of literature that I, specific literature that I enjoyed very much. And I think it helped me a great deal. Uh, and there were periods of time uh, in, uh, that I had uh, during the war to, to uh, 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 one or two people in Cincinnati in a group of, uh, that were, were uh, close friends of my family, uh, decided to for, uh, start a kind of a collection uh, that I still have uh, in huge binders uh, of letters from people in our so-called Jewish community primarily, but others too, that he collected on a monthly basis. Letters from the Pacific, letters from uh, Europe, people that were just in this country that in, in the service of the Navy, Army, whatever, Air, Air Force. Um, and uh, it was collected eventually over a period of three or more years. And uh, some of us still have these bound things that are about this big and really wonderful letters uh, that were written. And I had an opportunity while I was in England uh, to find out that uh, the wife of a very prominent judge in Cincinnati uh, was in London uh, at the Savoy Hotel uh, where they had the old-fashioned large apartments, not just rooms, uh, in there. And I, my father and I went to see her and she said, uh, you know, sharing the apartment with me is uh, you might know him, a fellow by the name of James Scotty Reston uh, of the New York Times. Uh, he was then a foreign correspondent, so I met Scotty Reston and uh, he said to me, you know, if you ever make it through the war, come to see me in Washington, D.C., because I might want you to write some stories for, for me. Well, I thought, you know, for a while, I'm going to be a journalist. And then I thought, hell, there's no money in that at all. So I went back to Cincinnati and went to work for my uncle uh, for a short while, which was a total disaster because I hated the things that I was involved in. And I got involved in a, uh, with people that I knew socially a little bit, uh, and uh, which became the largest scrap metal brokerage company in the United States, eventually. Uh, and uh, uh, after a training period of some months, I was sent down here to uh, take over a defunct office that had been here since 1921. Mm -hmm. They were major, during in the 1920s, they were major exporters from Texas City, uh, Mobile, <laughs> New Orleans, Beaumont, and even Corpus Christi, uh, going to Japan and Europe. Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, one of the people that uh, I initially did some work with for when I came down here used to say to me, kid, he, he said, if you saw these boats, they were like taxi cabs coming in and out here, <laughs> these boats. Uh, there's an interesting history that I wrote up uh, with my own autobiography that my kids want me to do, uh, that uh, uh, in the early 20s, our company was the only employer in Texas City, Texas. There was not a single refinery, chemical plant of any kind around there. The only thing you had was a switch railroad, the Texas City Terminal Railroad, and the rest of it was, we had several hundred people that uh, we had at any one time 250 to 300,000 tons of scrap metal piled up on the docks of Texas City, Texas. Um, and uh, 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 there was no place to go. There were no steel mills, 
uh, no foundries of any kind in uh, the Southwest at that time. Uh, when I first came here, I remember we were shipping barges out of Texas to St. Louis, Peoria, Illinois, Chicago, and some to Pittsburgh even. Uh, that was in the early 1950s. And, uh, but at that, actually, I should say, uh, uh, a steel mill was started here in 1942 uh, on the ship channel. And uh, then eventually one in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, or Sand Springs, Oklahoma, which is a suburb uh, there. And lo and behold, uh, the Arkansas River was made navigable uh, into Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma. So that was, in, that was an important situation. Uh, I stayed with that same company for 40 years. I was retired by them in 1982. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I was 62 years old, uh, the company policy had been that uh, whether you were a janitor or the president of the company, you, you had to retire at 60. Well, I was already 62 by that time and I said, it's time for you to get out. My motor was running so badly, so I happened to meet, not right away, but uh, around mid-80s, uh, I met a man who was uh, solo, you might say, in a business that was, uh, uh, oh, by the way, I was also told that when I was retired that I could not go into a competitive mm. business. I had to sign papers and so on. I was actually an idiot to do that uh, at the time. But in any case, once I met this man, uh, he wanted me to work with him uh, in uh, acquisitions, mergers, uh, and industrial recruiting in the valve business, the pipe business, oil and gas, and things like that that we were in. I was with him for 19 years, and I was 80, 88 when I retired. Uh, one reason was that uh, he very suddenly died. He was 72 years old. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I was left with some really major international uh, things that I was, we were working on. And his widow uh, said to me, you know, I uh, really think we ought to close the business. So I spent six months here at home, gradually closing up the business. And we were doing business in, in the Middle East, England, mm -hmm. uh, over here. And I, I learned a great deal about uh, what has been so much in the news in the last few years about uh, offshore uh, deep sea exploration and the big projects that, uh, that you get involved in. Uh, and uh, uh, so it was fascinating. And uh, uh, I was with him for 19 years. Uh, we really worked as par almost as partners, and uh, uh, I felt a tremendous loss mm -hmm. in having this man go because we were just everything just clicked. It just was the kind of a uh, relationship uh, that uh, uh, you can only dream about, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think I was very fortunate because. Uh, uh, it was totally different than what I had done for almost 40 years mm -hmm. in many respects. And I felt I was good at it. Uh, so uh, I, it was difficult for me to actually, even at 88, to stop. But I thought it was a little obscene for me to continue. <laughs> <laughs> at 88, I thought. You had two great careers. Enough yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but uh, the last few years with my former company, uh, were spent uh, not here as in the district. Uh, uh, we merged with a very large uh, Dutch company that was in the coal trading business worldwide. And I spent some time with them overseas, uh, in uh, not only in Holland, but in, in France, and England, and uh, uh, Italy, Portugal. Spain, what have you, 
and uh, that was very all very interesting. And uh, uh, I became sort of a troubleshooter. Mm -hmm. We wanted to, uh, uh, considering that we were a so-called national company, uh, we uh, were beginning to do business with a. A uh, company that we had an exclusive relationship with in many other parts of the country, and uh, uh, they were going to the West Coast, and we had absolutely no presence anywhere in the Western states. So I spent from 1978 to 19, early 1982, virtually living in California. Mm. I commuted back here to see whether I still had a family every three, four weeks, and uh, but uh, I spent a great deal of time in the, the uh, uh, Northwest uh, Pacific area, within Oregon and, and Washington State and Montana and in uh, uh, Idaho and in uh, uh, oh gosh, all over the place, and uh, mm -hmm. it was. Uh, in a way fascinating, uh, and uh, uh, one of the most interesting things I want to mention on a personal basis that uh, uh, when I lived in Los Angeles, I found, uh, partially by coincidence, uh, a woman who was then in her mid-80s, uh, who was my mother's closest friend when they, they grew up together, they went to school together, and uh, uh, and knew each other, uh, and she was in her 80s. She was a very, in, in, uh, she had a most interesting life. She fled all through France ahead of the Nazis mm -hmm. because she lived there. She went to Spain. Uh, she eventually ended up coming to the United States, to the West Coast, and, uh, uh, and started uh, an antique business. Uh, and she had connections in France with uh, 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 art houses that she was able to get very cheaply and become a, a buyer of art houses that she sold in Los Angeles, primarily to very wealthy people there, and was enormously successful. Among other things, she had an accounting background, mm -hmm. so she really ran her own business. And uh, uh, her daughter, married a, uh, an owner of a radio station in California. Uh, eventually they moved to Adelaide, Australia, because uh, their only child, their daughter, had uh, met and married an Australian law professor who was on, uh, I think, doing some, some sabbatical work at UCLA. And uh, anyway, uh, the old lady uh, was close to 90 years old when she moved, a major move for her after being in Los Angeles for, God knows, uh, from probably the uh, late 30s on. Uh, so this was a wonderful, uh, you might say, uh, contact. Uh, and. Uh, uh, even though she was a good deal older than than I was, uh, we could uh, reminisce uh, a great deal. And uh, uh, she was a, a very feisty person, who I think uh, uh, sort of took a shine to me, and I felt uh, and it was a lot of nostalgia in a mm. way for us too. Uh, so I I had at least somebody, but I did make some friends out there that uh, I still have as friends uh, to this day. And uh, uh, there was a time actually when we thought, gee, I'd like to move out here, mm -hmm. but there were, we, we just felt it was too much of a, a move to make. So, so with her you could reminisce about your mother and you could right. discover more and More things mother. that, uh, uh, that uh, I, you know, as a small child didn't really know very much about. Sure. So that was a very interesting period uh, for me in being out there. And uh, I really did a lot of pioneering out there because the company now 
uh, is uh, uh, virtually has taken over almost everything that was that were competitors mm -hmm. of ours on the west coast, uh, and uh, uh, so that was a uh, uh, essentially a, a period uh, that uh, I felt uh, 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 sort of like. Uh, uh, I've been there at the creation <laughs> of everything that was going on. And today they're very big. My company is, uh, my former company is, because I say my company, because I still have pensions from them, uh, that uh, uh, it's probably one of the best known uh, steel companies that bought out our company called Nucor Steel. I don't know whether you've ever mm -hmm. heard of them. Mm -hmm. But Nucor Steel has, has got plants in Jewett, Texas, near Buffalo, Texas, uh, uh, and halfway between here and Dallas. And uh, they have plants all over the, all over the country uh, now. And they were one of the few companies with their methods and their policies that was able to compete with the foreign steel that was mm -hmm. uh, uh, such shock to, to the old big steel companies uh, that uh, so bitterly complain, like the oil companies do, do about what the government is is doing to them on the regulations. The steel companies, the steel companies were had the the uh, thought that the government should protect them. Uh, big steel, mm -hmm. whether it was U.S. steel or the steel mill here, which became Armco Steel, uh, and uh, all these companies that uh, cried cried their eyes out uh, uh, about how uh, that the government should set up protection, tariff protection, uh, to bring in, not to bring in foreign, foreign steel, something like that. Anyway, uh, the, uh, 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 I felt that I had a uh, uh, pretty successful career. Yeah, well, you saw a lot of change in the global uh, yes. market. I saw a great deal of change yeah. in the global market. Uh, I uh, uh, I should mention to you that uh, uh, fairly typical of uh, uh, not necessarily all German Jewish families, but uh, I was very much aware that uh, uh, there was a lot of bad blood. Uh, between my father and uh, and uh, uh, numerous relatives, uh, he had one sister uh, who uh, was married uh, to a Catholic who was turned out to be the great nephew of Johann Strauss, the Waltz King. Mm -hmm. So they, he, she was protected all during war in Berlin, Germany. Uh, she became quite ill towards the end of the war uh, and was hospitalized there, but always well taken care of by the Nazis and uh, everything like that. They had one son and they sent their son to Austria and they eventually moved to Austria at the end of the war uh, to, to Vienna. Now, she had not talked to my father, he had not talked to her, to her and numerous other relatives for almost 40 years. Uh, this was probably, uh, well, quite frankly, I thought it was crazy because, uh, but there were Hatfields and McCoy situations uh, uh, throughout a lot of these families. And uh, uh, I mean, you know, it isn't a specialty of <laughs> these people there because I've seen it happen in this country too. Uh, but what, the reason I'm mentioning this is in 1973 I decided that whoever was left, I'd go to Europe uh, and spend about two weeks in seeing all of them and being the guy that uh, would uh, make links uh, with families that either had helped me when I was a kid and without a father and mother around, and uh, 
uh, really took care of me in a sense. And so I went to see uh, my uh, my uh, mother's sister uh, and her uh, daughter in London uh, and uh, uh, spent a little time, two, three days there. Uh, then I flew to uh, uh, Frankfurt or Wiesbaden to see my stepmother uh, and uh, saw her actually before that time in the mid-60s, I think it was. My wife and I went to, to Europe for three weeks and uh, at that time I wouldn't go to Germany. I did, just didn't want to travel mm -hmm. to Germany. And uh, uh, I had my stepmother come to Paris and stay with us for a couple of days. And uh, but I uh, I saw her in 1973. I did go to Germany, and um, uh, then uh, I went to I, I went on business to Germany to the Ruhr area to visit uh, steel plants, and uh, uh, some of the Dutch people that were our partners at the time accompanied me. And uh, we have one very interesting thing that happened uh, at the Krupp Works, the famous Krupp Works. Uh, we were uh, asked to stay in the executive dining room for lunch, uh, and uh, they were all very much in uniforms. I mean, the, the, the waitresses waiting on us, and uh, I think the director of purchasing turned to me uh, during our conversation at lunch. He said. Speak an awfully good German. Where did you learn German? I said, Oh, in school. <laughs> <laughs> Which was true. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. So, and the Dutch, Dutch across from me, of course, knew my story. <laughs> they just had to go like this. <laughs> so you were able to see your aunt on that? Well, I saw my aunt. I saw my aunt in Austria and Vienna. I was there, and uh, so it was two weeks with various relatives that I spent. And in 1975, I did the same thing again. Uh, and uh, at that time, unfortunately, my stepmother, uh, who lived in Wiesbaden in a very lovely retirement uh, home, uh, I learned from her, one of her relatives, who was a doctor, woman doctor, uh, contacted me at the hotel and said, uh, that uh, you better come fairly quickly because she is dying of cancer. And she was conscious really only for a few minutes when I went there to see her in, in, in Wiesbaden, uh, Germany, where she was in a very lovely retirement home that they had at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, I uh, uh, remember uh, at the Frankfurt airport, renting a big fat red Mercedes, and uh, uh, drove about ninety miles an hour on the on the autobahn <laughs> to get to this place. So I was people. I saw people looking at me. <laughs> this, this guy. I, I said, I own this piece of land. <laughs> anyway. Uh, no, I uh, I had a uh, uh, a very nice visit uh, the first time, actually the second time too. But uh, uh, and uh, uh, about uh, I think it was 1978. Uh, I was in uh, Holland at the time, and I called my aunt and my father's sister in Vienna. She was then in her early 90s. And uh, she said, are you coming to see me? And I said, well, I'm here on business. I don't think I can get away at all to do that. And, and if you travel within Europe at all, your airfares are very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, you know, for a day or two just to do that, I just didn't want to do that really at that time. But I'm, in a way, I'm sorry I didn't do it uh, because uh, she was really only one of the close relatives that was left at that time. So, and now we don't have anybody mm -hmm. left there. They're all, they're all dead. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, 
I guess I was lucky in a way to do that. Mm -hmm. But it meant a lot to me to uh, uh, to uh, visit people that, you know, in a way you could say I made a complete break. Uh, I became, became not only a U.S. citizen, but uh, uh, I sort of left everything behind. Mm -hmm. And during the war, you don't think about that uh, necessarily, that you have relatives close by and whatever. I was lucky enough uh, to be able to be in England for six months uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, see my father uh, and stepmother. Uh, and uh, uh, so, and that was not really very often, you know, every a uh, couple of months you could spend o overnight uh, there uh, because I, I, I think my outfit was was uh, very uh, uh, generous in giving me passes because mm -hmm. they knew that I had a father living in, in, in England. Well, what do you think fueled this um, irreconcilable situation between your father and his sister? Uh, I think it was probably very foolish. Uh, in many ways it was uh, probably uh, uh, resentments uh, over some stupid family situations. They were, <coughs> if you were to sit down with a, uh, a psychotherapist today, you probably would think in terms, was this necessary? You know, it, it was just, uh, uh, these were things that uh, that uh, uh, it's sort of uh, uh, like somebody saying uh, that uh, uh, you uh, uh, have a uh, uh, a very steady personality, always mad at somebody. You know, some people just have a chip on their shoulder. I think a lot of it was just paranoia about virtually nothing that is important. But they all thought it was, and uh, uh, I think, frankly, uh, uh, that uh, uh, coming to the United States, you uh, you don't have that intense relationships. I found that you have. Uh, uh, I mean, you either have friends or you have family that uh, that you you get along with, or you. Uh, you know, you take it or leave it almost kind of a thing. It's not the same over there. I think people, uh, uh, if you uh, uh, said one said one bad word about somebody, uh, it it was taken to heart to such an extent that I learned a great deal. I think fortunately in this country and not taking everybody too seriously mm -hmm. about. Uh, about a lot of things. And I think if, I was very fortunate to be with my family. Uh, of the, them, uh, they had uh, three children themselves. They were younger than I was. Uh, my uh, cousin who lives in Washington, D.C., uh, is the oldest. He, uh, 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 Bob is 87. Uh, he has a sister that is in her, she's 86 or 87, she uh, uh, lives in Chicago uh, and uh, uh, has been an uh, assistant living for years and years. Uh, she's not in very good shape. And the youngest one uh, is in her early 80s uh, and uh, she uh, decided to leave the family altogether and move to, they had some summer homes in, in Canada, in Ontario, Canada, uh, in, on a lake, and she decided to move there. Uh, she uh, uh, was married to two, three different people that's, that she came across, that kind of thing. She has three or four children, each by the different people. It was that kind of a thing. She was a rebel of sorts. And uh, then, um, the, uh, uh, my cousin in Washington, D.C., uh, I'm in touch with pretty regularly. 
Uh, we, uh, he was the best man at my wedding. Uh, we stayed in pretty good touch with each other. Uh, Bob was in the 8th Air Force. He was in 30 missions over Germany. He was lucky to get through. He was uh, uh, a navigator. And, uh, uh, and he uh, decided to not to stay in his family business. Uh, they sold a family business to, but you hear so many times these days, to a major corporation. And uh, the family profited handsomely to set up trust funds for their, all their children, stuff like that. And they, uh, uh, he decided uh, after he went to uh, Harvard Business School and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, also studied at Columbia and Dartmouth, uh, he became an FTC uh, member of their their uh, uh, anti-trust uh, mm -hmm. division, uh, and uh, uh, he writes a great deal and, and gives talks on, on econ economic issues, uh, and uh, uh, lives up <laughs> nice trust funds. <laughs> so uh, anyway. Uh, those are really the few direct families that uh, that I have left, mm. uh, and uh, uh, I tell you one thing: I've you know given some talks here and there to veterans groups and and also to uh, uh, high school children uh, about the war, things like that. And I think one of the things that uh, always come to mind when I speak to them: I said, the older you get, and you're around gets to be very lonely because almost everybody's gone uh, that you've known, whether they family, whether they're friends, and uh, uh, you, uh, uh, and gradually uh, you lose everybody that is around you. And being, uh, that's not exactly a nice thing about living as long uh, in that. But when I think to myself overall uh, of having been born at the end of World War I and uh, living through this period, you begin to really appreciate history mm -hmm. a great deal because you've seen an awful lot and you've been through an awful lot of things. So, well, yeah. well I'd like to go back to the summer of 1941. Okay, uh, the summer of 1941, uh, I found myself uh, uh, needing one, one credit, so I went. I went to the draft board and I said, can I get a deferment for about a month and a half, something like that, to finish the course that I had to take during the summer. And then uh, I was drafted uh, and, uh, uh, and was sent to uh, uh, a place called Camp Lee outside of Petersburg, Virginia, which was brand new at the time. And uh, uh, I found myself being in the medics. Why? I couldn't tell you. And you you know you learn a lot about what you're supposed to be doing in the field, uh, and uh, and how to treat uh, uh, wounded uh, people, and uh, I thought well, so I'm in the medics, and uh, after about two or three weeks there, I I got a message that uh, I had to come back and get a pass to get back to Cincinnati, Ohio, because they had a district. Uh, court there, uh, federal district court there, and uh, that uh, I was to get my citizenship papers. Uh, and uh, uh, I was interviewed uh, by a couple of the newspapers there because I was in uniform and they had never seen anybody in an American uniform that was sworn in to become a United States citizen. So, <laughs> and uh, uh, then uh, after I think uh, four or six weeks there at Camp Lee, uh, we were, uh, many of us were transferred to the 9th Infantry Division at Fort Bragg. And I thought to myself, uh, you know, what the hell am I doing here <laughs> in a place called Fayetteville, it was called Fadelberg, which <laughs> is a terrible town, uh, really. 
a typical army town. It was a huge camp and uh, was known as a, an artillery training camp primarily. Uh, later on it was shared by us uh, and uh, I think I mentioned to you that we were uh, sort of became the mother of the 82nd Airborne uh, and uh, uh, I found myself uh, with uh, I would say 80% of Brooklynites, really a bunch of tough guys, many of them Italian or Italian descent, uh, some New Jersey people, mostly from the East, and uh, uh, they all, you know, had either high school education or were uh, uh, people who had uh, been in some capacity, there were a few people, by the way, who had been in the regular army, uh, including some of the officers. There were some officers who had been in the cavalry here at Fort Sam Houston. The, many of the officers were from the South, and uh, uh, the, the, most of the enlisted men were from the East, Eastern states, New England, uh, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and so on. Uh, I was one of the few people from Ohio at that particular time. Mm. So I learned uh, basically a new language altogether uh, and it was fascinating and we all became uh, sooner or later all very close friends. Really. I mean it was just uh, uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, uh, including the officers uh, for that matter and at first I was in the medics in, in the medical battalion uh, and uh, uh, of the division only when we we were in in a uh, call it uh, business I mean uh, in a uh, uh, bivouac area in a place called Port Laoti uh, uh, French Morocco, uh, and uh, again, this was a fascinating period because uh, uh, if you were at all in any contact with natives, the women all wore veils, and it was very primitive in many ways. Uh, although the French had settled that part of Morocco uh, since the 1870s. Uh, Port Leodi was named after General Port uh, Leodi. By the way, I should go back a minute and tell you, which is an interesting thing, that our landings were covered by the battleship Texas, which is over here in the Central Monument now, <laughs> in mothballs or whatever else you could call it. <laughs> uh, and I think to myself, when we happened to on, once in a while go out to one of the restaurants out there, uh, to see that uh, thing and to think back to, to November 8, 1942. It so happened that there were, was another landing by one of our regiments. They were formed into combat teams uh, in a place called Safi, which was right near Casablanca, uh, the landings there. And uh, ours was further north, north of Rabat, which was then the capital of French Morocco. The French were very smart in colonizing uh, uh, Morocco uh, in the 1870s. Uh, they induced through tax situations and uh, various other incentives, induced uh, surprisingly a lot of French Jewish people, to merchants, to move there uh, to start businesses, uh, to grow orchards, to uh, do a lot of exporting from those areas of uh, <coughs> all sorts of materials. So surprisingly enough, when we got there, the Vichy French were the ones that opposed us and that opposed the landings. Uh, and they had both native troops uh, and, um, uh, and some French non-commissioned and some officers there. We fought actually in Port Lake, uh, uh and Safi, they marched right in. There was no opposition. In Port Leone, we had three days of fighting. And we landed actually at a 
sea resort place that had cabanas and swimming pools and everything else, and a lot of dead bodies around there that, that our, the first wave or first two or three waves, we were strafed by French planes when we landed. So it was amazing. And they ha actually had a huge mountain area at the entrance of a river that was going on. Here's the beach, here's the mountain, here's a, a, a small river, and right above the river on the embankment was railroad tracks, and they had a naval gun that was moving back and forth on these tracks, shooting at us. And uh, uh, this mountain was called the Cosba, and they had, uh, which now is an American cemetery for some of our people. We had, I think, some uh, between 30 and 40 casualties, actually, during that fighting. Uh, interesting thing, they had a big stadium at the edge of town, uh, and the, all the Jewish people were assembled and stayed up in the grass of the, of the stadium. Hmm. They were herded there. I've also found, interestingly enough, that towns further inland into the desert, like McNess, City Belabes, which uh, which is the which the headquarters still is, I think, of the French Foreign Legion. Um, and uh, by the way, they did have some legionnaires fighting also against us at that time. Um, and uh, uh, they were rounded up there by the Vichy French. Uh, what they were going to do with them, I don't know. But in Magnes, which is a uh, let me go back one second and tell you that these cities are all very modern cities. Beautiful highways, uh, high-rise buildings all over the place. Uh, back in the, in the early 40s, I'm talking about now. Uh, for some reason, we had a chance to go to Meknes, a town in the desert that had a synagogue that looked like uh, an old Berlin synagogue, beautiful old ornaments and everything else. And uh, uh, I think that a lot of the uh, population were what they call Sephardic Jews that were originally from Spain or, uh, and uh, of course in France also, uh, that lived there. Commerce apparently built up all these cities over the years from the 1870s on into the 20th century, uh, early 20th century. So, uh, surprisingly, a lot of these towns were quite modern. Uh, in December of 1942, we were taken out of these bivouac areas uh, to, uh, in uh, what was called the 40 and 8. I don't know whether you've heard, heard of that. 40 and 8 was 40 men and 8 horses. Uh, uh, freight cars, little freight, car, freight cars. They were World War I freight cars, and they were called 40 and 8. Um, and uh, they took us up into the mountains, the Berber Mountains. Uh, and it was snowing. Uh, it's hard to believe this, but it was snowing. And then into the desert from there. And we were, that's when we started meeting the, in the Kasserin Pass and mm -hmm. uh, in uh, El Gatar and all these places. So, uh, that's where not only we met resistance, but we were absolutely clobbered. We were green as grass. I mean, we'd never been in combat before. The German had an air force. They, they strafed us. They bombed us. Uh, we had lots and lots of casualties. And uh, uh, we, I mean, there are many stories I could tell you. It's just too lengthy and involved. But we were... Uh, uh, oh, I, let me go back one second and tell you what I was doing then. Um, when we were still uh, housed in buildings in Port Leone, uh, the uh, uh, assistant G2, intelligence officer of the division, came to meet with me and my company commander and said, I want him, we have an idea that we need people that can do interpreting and uh, interrogation work and whatever. That we all knew at this, 
Uh, we've never done it before. This is kind of a new concept. And uh, could he be on detached service with us? So that's when I went to Division Headquarters of G2 and became, for the rest of the war basically, uh, out of the medics. I would, on many occasions, be housed with my old medical company uh, and uh, uh, I actually was uh, doing a lot of clerical work when I was free to do so for them. I handled all the insurances, uh, the uh, GI insurance, payrolls, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, and there were a lot of uh, uh, you might say personnel files that, mm -hmm. uh, that I had to take care of, along with our first sergeant, who also was from Long Island, and he he called me Stein. <laughs> and my nickname became Gestapo, <laughs> by the way. By, everybody in the division knew me as Gestapo. So, <laughs> because I was doing... So the idea was, uh, if you spend a lot of time with the medics, then the first thing you want to do is if you have wounded German prisoners from the Africa Corps, which, by the way, was probably as professional as an army as you would ever have in any army and in any country. I mean, they were truly professional soldiers from top to bottom and uh, uh, a formidable opponent, you might say, a foe. So anyway, uh, I we were doing a lot of improvising. We had no uh, no idea of how to go about doing all of this and how to do it. And you know, for the first time I began to, in talking to some of these people or interrogating them, I suddenly realized that I hadn't spoken any German in several years. And it really was, became frustrating at times not to be able to fluently, you know, it had to come back after a while. So uh, little did we know that uh, in the Second Corps, which was Operation Torch, really, uh, that uh, uh, we uh, were the guinea pigs for what later on, back in the 44, I think, they formed a Camp Riley or Fort Riley, Camp Riley in Maryland, that from those experiences that we had, the Army had gradually uh, set up manuals and everything else to uh, recruit people that had foreign languages, particularly German and Italian, possibly, to uh, or French, uh, to uh, 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 set up a camp to eventually to train these people in what we were doing. Uh, we wrote the manual, so to speak. <laughs> we were the first ones, both in, in Africa and Sicily. We were in Africa, North Africa, and ended up in Bizzardi, uh when we finally had the German surrender. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, being on top of a mountain and looking down into a valley uh, with probably as many as eighty to 100,000 German prisoners that you looked into. They were all rounded up and into uh, uh, cages of sorts that they had there uh, that all were the original major prisoners. Uh, of, uh, and of course we also worked closely with the British 8th, 8th Army, uh, Montgomery and that crowd uh, over there. And I found out for the first time that uh, what a class system they really had uh, when uh, we were always always starving, we were always hungry, never had enough food, uh, even sea rations. Sometimes it didn't get to us at all. So I went to one of their camps and I found that uh, that they had a special section for non-coms, special for the low, lower class people, <laughs> whatever, and uh, uh, to beg them for some a tin of biscuits, 
that we had uh, from them. They seemed to be better supplied than we were. And uh, uh, our division actually became known as uh, having stopped the Germans when they made a major thrust uh, through the American lines uh, with concentrated artillery. Uh, and the guy that set up this concentration of artillery became, uh, was our chief of staff, who uh, I mean, was not chief of staff then, he was uh, the colonel in charge of all artillery for our division. His name was William Westmoreland. You may have heard of him. Oh, yes. uh, and um, he decorated me later on in, in Germany, by the way. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, we, uh, through a concentration of uh, opposing tank forces that the Germans, uh, Panzer for forces that opposed us uh, uh, at uh, near the Casperin Pass area. Uh, and uh, I don't remember the time right now. Uh, I was, by the way, for two weeks attached to uh, French native troops. Uh, they were called the Goumiers. Uh, they were Berber mountain troops and they were natives and uh, the first day I was there, uh, they caught a sheep and they uh, strangled the sheep, put it on a tree limb, and with their wonderful knives that they had, they slit the belly open a little bit and blew into the area to be able to open the, the outer skin of the, uh, the wool around it. And then they, uh, one guy, but building a little fire uh, with some stones surrounding it. And one guy took out uh, the liver and the heart and everything like that. And they had these long sticks that had sharp points and they would put this meat on there and then they held it into the fire and they said, here, eat it. So, <laughs> the I have, I have, I, there's a write up about, about me that uh, that I was supposed to have said, supposedly said, which I didn't say. Well, it beats sea rations. <laughs> <laughs> so the, they were people that had these huge belts and these what looked like uh, nightgowns, these striped nightgowns that were very warm. I mean, heavy wool nightgowns, and they wore mostly bands around their heads, and they all had beards like this, huge beards. And they were uh, people that could go into the, at night especially, into the German lines uh, and cut off their ears. And they would have, uh, they would have ears all around their belts. These ears, <laughs> whatever, or they slit their throat mostly. Anyway, they were fierce looking guys. And I remember uh, in Bizzardi, uh, uh I don't know where I, I was going in a jeep and I saw this small formation that looked like a platoon of Goumiers with a French non-commissioned officer who had a swivel stick under his arm like this. And they were supposed to be um, uh, it, being at attention. It meant their rifles had to be like this. And this guy goes up to one of them, apparently he was a little bit out of line, and he hit him with that swivel stick across the face. And I began to think, you know, don't they rebel against these guys, these French? These were French natives. No, they didn't. That was apparently uh, part of the course. Uh, have you by any chance ever read or know of a famous writer for the New Yorker magazine called A.J. Liebling? Does that name mm -hmm. ring a bell? Mm -hmm. uh, Liebling was one of the people, Ernie Powell, I mean, all of these people, uh, well, I was, because some of them traveled with us. Uh, there's a famous story uh, about uh, a soldier with one of our, with our 60th regiment, uh, which was one of our three regiments of our division, uh, that uh, uh, is a famous story that was made into a book that was written about him and all of his exploits uh, in uh, uh, Algeria and Tunisia uh, in there. 
I mean, you talk about primitive living. Uh, it was, um, there were areas where we would be in, uh, say, uh, set up tents near a wooded area, and uh, everybody would have dysentery. Everybody. I mean, you would hardly really get, get up and get going. At the end of the fighting, they took us near, outside of, we wouldn't go into town, no. City Belle Abbes, where the French Foreign Legion was, was two miles away. We were in a wooded area. We had to be setting up shelter halves in there, and most of us uh, were just, you know, like this. Um, and if you went to your, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, kitchen to catch something to eat, your mess kit, would, the minute you have food on your face, was covered with flies uh, all over the place. Our commanding general made us, this is after the fighting, uh, we were, all we were wearing is boots and underwear, uh, no tops. They made us put full field packs on and walk a mile and run a mile, uh, no matter how much you were out of it in order to keep your, uh, you know, your physical strength up uh, with them. Eventually, I think it was in, I think they moved us to a town called Oran, which is near Algiers, uh, seaport, <coughs> on the Mediterranean, and uh, uh, there we embarked uh, on ships. Uh, small merchant ships to go over to Sicily. Mm. And I remember we, at, at night, landing, or after dark, landing in Palermo, outside of Palermo Har Harbor, and we were strafed again on the boats by German. Uh, uh, the British had already landed in another part of, it, of Sicily. Uh, we were landing near Palermo, and uh, uh, and we had to walk with full gear uh, from after we uh, d disembarked uh, uh, about two miles to a railroad track, and we were taken on inland from there. Mm -hmm. Sicily was uh, really uh, uh, it was interesting. I mean, I could tell you a lot of stories, of individual stories. I, one of them I can recall being uh, overnight in a jeep on top of a mountain. Uh, in the interior of Sicily, uh, I mean, you could you feel, felt like you were in New Guinea or some place like that, but far from any civilization. There was nothing else around, and you wake up and we have one of these huge aerials on the on on this jeep, and it's, it's the guy turned on the radio, the armed forces playing Glenn Miller tunes, and in this godforsaken place. And it just felt, you know, you were, your spirits were lifted all of a sudden. <laughs> it was just great, you know, to have little things like this were just uh, terrific. It was near a place called Troina in, in Sicily. And I remember swimming in the Tyrrhenian Sea uh, and uh, uh, thinking to myself, uh, here goes Odysseus. <laughs> <laughs> the Odyssey, <laughs> so it was, it was, it was uh, uh, and uh, one time in a bivouac area, a farmer comes along with looks like a wheel this big. It was some goat cheese that was <laughs> that he gave, gave to us. In France, I had a guy uh, in central France that came uh, late one afternoon. We were in a, had set up pup tents. Uh, outside of this town, and this guy came along with a bottle of champagne that he had kept for about 60 or more years that he wanted to give to somebody, one of the liberators, <laughs> things like that. Well, that's great. Well, now, there, I could, you know, there are an awful lot of different incidents mm -hmm. that uh, I've written some essays <clears throat> that uh, I could remember specific situations about that I felt like writing. Uh, about uh, and uh, did, uh, uh, but um, um, I would say that uh, uh, I was actually I was lucky uh, because um, uh, there were many times I was with the aid stations uh, when we landed in Normandy uh, in on Utah Beach. 
uh, I probably had uh, a field day with uh, both wounded and non-wounded German prisoners. And uh, uh, I have a commendation from the general about establishing a uh, whole plan or method where either ambulances would take me to the aid stations or a jeep that I had available to me. I was, I probably was the only soldier in the American Army in combat that had, uh, you might say, could go anywhere I wanted to. Mm. I, I met German, I mean French resistance fighters, I was uh, towns people in these villages in Normandy that I spoke to. Fortunately, I was had enough French still that I was able to speak and gradually as you go along you learn more about it and uh, uh, it was uh, in many ways I was everywhere but I was very lucky because uh, it wasn't until we were in the Hurtgen Forest and I was wounded the first time I was uh, actually standing near some ambulances when all of a sudden I said to one guy God something is stinging me like me well I had a, a piece of shrapnel slice right into my calf and uh, fortunately it was just a flesh wound and I went to my old company which was called a clearing company uh, and they gave me a tetanus shot bandaged me and said you're sticking around here uh, for about a week don't you go anywhere uh, and I did and the next time around we were on the east bank of the Rhine River we had uh, captured uh, the Raymagen Bridge, the only called the Raymagen Bridge, is really called the Ludendorff Bridge after the famous World War I German general Ludendorff. And, uh, and you know, history tells you it was intact. It, they were ready to, to blow it. And uh, we captured all the guys that, that were, and those guys later on uh, were, uh, uh, I, actually, we didn't capture them. They, they, ran away and they later on were shot by a Hitler's personal command. <laughs> they were all they were all shot because they, they didn't stand their ground or they d didn't do the job that they were supposed to do. Well over there uh, was interesting thing happened that we were in a right on, on the banks of the river there were small houses around there and we were looking for a place to stay uh, and uh, I went up to this house and an old guy, must have been in his 70s, comes out and he said, I'm the only one here, he speaks perfect American English. And uh, I said, what the hell? He said, well, he spent 20 years in the United States, apparently. But he moved back, his whole family was gone, and he lived there alone in this house. And I said, well, we're taking it over. And he said, well, I have, I have some eggs here, some fresh eggs. So, you know, anything that you could get in the way of uh, regular food or se semblance of regular food was wonderful. Uh, so about four of us went upstairs and he had a complete empty room with a huge uh, uh, plate glass window overlooking the Rhine River. And at the other end of the room was a dilapidated old couch. So we sit there on this couch, all, all of us, and just joking around, kidding around, whatever. And one guy even had a bottle of wine that he swiped from somewhere. Uh, and um, uh, the Germans by this time tried to demolish that bridge, Every, everything from artillery or whatever it is. And I swear to this day that I saw out of the corner of my eye a huge, almost looked like a fireball, and, and this enormous explosion, it lifted us from the couch and this glass from this plate glass window is all over our faces and, and body. And all over. I mean, not very deep, but sufficiently so that we all were bleeding, whatever, so we went to the aid station to get us fixed up. So <laughs> that was the only two times I was, I was hit. In, and, uh, uh, today you could say having the Purple Heart gets you 
get your free passes and you get free at municipal air, and airports and everywhere and whatever <laughs> and any place here in town where you have a uh, uh, you, you can park free whatever and you can go on the on the uh, uh, beltway uh, <laughs> Uh, you, you don't have to pay for anything like that, so this is what's left over. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, uh, it. Uh, by the way, I want to men mention one more thing. Uh, in um, 1993, uh, I learned through my cousin in New York uh, that uh, 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 or, or his, her, her husband, um, who is also from Mannheim, Germany, uh, that the city of Mannheim asked them uh, to, uh, all expenses paid, to pay a visit to his old home in Mann Mannheim mm -hmm. for a few days, whatever it is. All expenses paid. And I learned that a number of German towns had set up what they call reparations for people my sister and I got a small amount of money uh, years before, back in the, I think in the 60s or 70s, for school interruption. I know we got each of us around twelve, fifteen hundred dollars or something like that. And uh, uh, it turned out uh, that a, one of my closest friends that I grew up with, who was a year older than I was. And uh, father was Jewish, mother was Gentile. Uh, and uh, uh, he was drafted into the German army, uh, lost an arm on the Russian front, uh, was uh, kicked out of the army, uh, went into hiding uh, in Berlin uh, for two or three years, and became eventually, he was a brilliant guy, um, he uh, became one of Willy Brandt's, uh, uh, I'd say, assistant, so to speak. He uh, became a, the Germans call their consulate men in, in a major city like Berlin senators. So his name is Lipschitz, uh, Senator Lipschitz was in, became, in, became in, in charge of developing reparations for uh, people that were alive and living in, whether in Israel, Australia, United States, or wherever, to find them. Well, one of the things uh, happened was that we were contacted by the Berlin government uh, my sister and I, oh no, I was first, then I told my sister about it and I told her what to, to contact in the Berlin Senate and they arranged for, uh, I think two, three times a year, they take 200 people in Berlin, uh, that's what I, because I'm familiar with this, uh, all expenses paid, f uh, flight, luxury hotels in Berlin and a week or seven to eight days uh, they take you to, they, f the first night they take you to one hotel and have a meeting there and at the end of the meeting they give you a check, a German check to cash for $350 or something like that, they're spending money. And then they have buses and they have all kinds of transportation, theater, musicals, uh, opera performance, uh, sightseeing in Potsdam and the South Sea and uh, uh, trips on the Wannsee, the outside of Berlin, that wonderful lake they have there, and free time. Hmm. Uh, my sister and I, my wife and one other lady, went on the subway uh, to uh, my old apartment and it was a two-story apartment. It was downstairs in the basement and the regular apartment. And the way we got in there was interesting because you, uh, you had to have either a key or a special pass. And some lady went into the vestibule of the apartment house and we scooted in with her. And I knocked on the door of my old apartment, which was on the first floor in the basement 
uh, and uh, lady answers the uh, phone and she said, who are you? You know, in German. And I said, I used to live here. And I went in. <laughs> so she said, to say and he was absolutely frightened. And I said, I want to go first downstairs. Well, it turned out that our whole apartment, which, which was huge, uh, an architect, an accountant, and an attorney. They all had offices there with office staff uh, in there. And I went downstairs, and the attorney is in there, and he speaks almost perfect English. And uh, I said to him, you know, this used to be my room. Uh, and uh, I used to play with an electric train down here, and, uh, uh, and oh, he said uh, uh, to me, uh, oh, you're with the, with the the group that he heard about this, the, like the reparations group or something like that. He said, uh, the, the German Jews were my best friends. And I, I said, yeah, I should, you should live so long. <laughs> so anyway, then uh, a secretary comes up to me when we went back upstairs and she said, oh, if you want to look around, you should see the bathroom. It has this beautiful blue tile. I said, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we spent about an hour there. And uh, then we went over to my sister, said, you know, uh, this is a big girl's school that was in the neighborhood also. So we went there and I find out that my own school had been completely bombed out in a brand new building, which was an office uh, uh, building for a big chemical company, had uh, had a brand new building, very modern building. So we went over to her school, which was never bombed at all, and it was huge. So we went to the office, and they also spoke perfectly. So I said, is Dr. So-and-so, uh, is he still alive? No, his, his picture's on the wall here. He died in, I think, 1950, something like that. And he was an old man. I said, well, he was one of the really best teachers I had. He was also the headmaster of the school. And uh, uh, she said, would you like to buy a sweatshirt that has the German logo, uh, the Berlin logo of the bear, which is the black bear? Uh, and I said, I'd love to. I said, if you can find one for my size. So I, I, I still have it, I think. <laughs> Hardly ever worn it. But in any case, so we, were, we went there and we uh, saw the old school. And it turns out that apparently they merged uh, our, uh, our old school after it was bombed out with them during the war mm. and uh, still had it there. But one of the other apartments that we lived in uh, later on, I think, uh, before my mother passed away, uh, was also completely demolished and had a brand new high-rise apartment there. Uh, but it was interesting to see all that and to see uh, how Berlin had been rebuilt and everything like that. Uh, then at one of the meetings that the Berlin uh, government people wanted to have at their at this huge uh, uh, city hall, uh, buildings. Uh, I saw a guy, oh no, I think he raised his hand to ask a question and he mentioned his name and I said, my God, this was a kid I used to play, we used to play with and his family were good friends of my family. And I went up to him later on, he and his wife, he and his wife and he said yes, they had moved to England, uh, they fled to England and he and his uh, he moved to the United States. The rest of his family stayed in England, and uh, he lived in California. And uh, uh, he said, "You know, I have a car. I rented a car here." And uh, uh, apparently, he went out, which I uh, was really unfortunate. I didn't get to go there. Uh, there was a very famous old uh, German Jewish cemetery uh, way over in the east part of Germany of Berlin. And he went there uh, because most of our families have, you know, these big mausoleums in, uh, and, uh, uh, in there because my grandmother, my father's mother is buried there and all of, uh, all of my relatives that uh, uh, died before the, before the Nazis ever came in or were, you know. So this was 
one of the things, but we had so little time really to, mm -hmm. to uh, see everything. But it was amazing how everything was modernized. Mm -hmm. uh, every six months I get a, uh, a pamphlet called Actuel, which uh, touts the wonderful new developments and buildings that are going up and all the wonderful things that they're doing for the Jewish population. And, uh, and uh, uh, they just bend over backwards to show you everything. With the pitiful thing is that in the back of it, for two or three pages, are letters that are uh, written to the to the this magazine that says, "I went to such and such a school, and I'm wondering if uh, I could uh, uh, send greetings to such and such friends and mentions if so and so is still alive and where would they live." And they could be in Argentina, they could be in Australia, they could be in Israel, they could be in the United States. And all these letters, most of them in German, by the way, a uh, few of them in, in English. And it's, it really is heart-wrenching because these are people that are thinking back to their childhood sure. in the people that they've known. So anyway, uh, I'd like to read you if I may. Before we get to that, yeah, uh, I'd like to go back. One thing that interested me, you were talking about um, uh, the development, once you got into intelligence, developing kind of the techniques and uh, improvising yeah. some things. Can you talk a little bit about what sort of work that involved? Well, uh, interrogation basically in, in the field uh, uh, means that uh, if you have a prisoner, uh, the first things you ask are, what outfit were you in? Where did you come from? What concentration, what outfits were uh, in that area? Did you come by train? Uh, what specific area did you bivouac in? Where, whatever it is. So you want to get basically the idea of what's in front of you uh, right, right now. Where are the concentration of troops? What outfits are they? Are they panzer troops? Are they infantry? Are they artillery? Uh, are there railroad guns here? Whatever did you see? And then you frisk his entire pockets and his and all whatever he has, like a passport. He has all uh, everything where he was born, where he was raised, whatever. He may have family pictures. Is that your wife? Is that your son? Is that your uh, whoever it is? Uh, when were you decorated? Where? Where, were you, where did you come from? By the way, when we landed, uh, among the first units that we found were conscripted Poles. They weren't even Germans. They were fighting for the Germans, and of course they were lucky and happy as hell to be an American prisoner now at this point. So, so that was easy. Uh, then you come across somebody, especially in the elite, more elite units, like the uh, uh, tankers, the pan panzer units, uh, and SS troops. Uh, they uh, become very arrogant. They don't want to do anything. So mo a lot of times, I, you know, uh, Geneva Conventions, they go out the window. Uh, so you, you, I remember one, uh, just before we got into the fighting of the Battle of the Balls, uh, we captured a guy like this that was uh, uh, really, I mean, I'm not going to tell you anything, whatever it is. So we handed, would hand him a shovel, and I said, you start digging. And yeah, I said, you know what this is? This is going to be a grave right here. And uh, we would uh, either take a 45 and just, you know, play around with him while he's around there. Uh, and uh, on occasions I had guy who was my first sergeant was a guy who was like six foot three, uh, huge guy, big guy. And uh, uh, I said, you know, you want to get slapped around a little bit. So you would, uh, uh, and eventually, especially when they're, uh, uh, one of the things we learned with a lot of people was, you know, when we get through with you, we're sending you over to Russia. And that was really the key. Because that, whether men or women, uh, civilians or army people, 
that was one thing. I said, you know, we, we can send you over to, to Russian forces uh, in no time at all. That's what made them talk for the most part. I didn't have a whole lot of trouble, but uh, uh, I have to tell you that one of the things I was really ashamed of uh, was we had a guy that came in on a stretcher who was uh, apparently a captain uh, of a tank unit, of an army unit, uh, in an elite army unit. And you talk about a guy that was, you talk about arrogant. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, it wasn't simply a matter of, I don't, I'm not telling you anything. Uh, it was just, you know, he talked back to you, uh, whatever. And I, I don't know, I was so, so mad uh, that uh, uh, I just hauled off and slapped him. And here he was on a stretcher. He was, I mean, he was apparently not just conscious. He was, he was in pretty good shape, actually. They brought him in. And uh, uh, some people, you know, some of the officers around me just looked the other way. But I felt, Jesus, I'm, I'm not, uh, what made me do something stupid like that? Uh, another time, this was, uh, and part of this is, it's just briefly mentioned in there. We had virtually, this was in the Ruhr area, virtually give, have over 30,000 soldiers give up. And by that time, this year in 1945, uh, in March or whatever it was, uh, and uh, you had people who were 60 years old, you had people who were 12 years old, most pitiful looking people in uniform. Well, they brought in a general to me, and I, we were in the schoolhouse at the time, and uh, the uh, uh, colonel of the medical battalion said to me, I understand you're going to be interviewing a, uh, a German general. He said, I'm going to give you my, my jacket with the epaulets and the colonels you know, on, on there so that you look like a professional interviewing this guy. Uh, well, this guy was about as, you know, uh, he seemed to be in his 60s and was so, uh, you always could feel pity for the guy. I mean, it was sort of like saying, thank God it's all over for me. And there wasn't really a whole lot that I wanted out of him. I just wanted to know. Were you in charge of these people? Yes, he was, and uh, uh, this large group that had given themselves up, and he said, basically, you know, it's all over for us. And uh, I asked him some questions where he had been, what, uh, were there any staff people anywhere nearby that he knew of, uh, were, was there any additional fighting going on uh, in there? And uh, essentially he just answered, but he was so listless in a sense that you felt like this isn't even really an interrogation. Now, the other thing is that you may have maps that you take from them. Uh, you ask them who is here or there, whatever. Are there anything, is there anything at all that, uh, 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 that I should know about, uh, about of any value that, that you can, I guess. Uh, a lot of this was taught to me by the British. They were fabulous. I mean, they had done this for so many years, and they knew just all, all the techniques and all the specific things that you were looking for, and how to interpret a map, and a lot of things like that. I mean, we were there for over a week, it was almost two weeks, of really different classes that you went to. and. Uh, uh, I thought to myself, my God, this is like day and night from what we, uh, you know, we had to pick up our, by ourselves of what we wanted to know. Uh, and uh, uh, you had uh, uh, papers prepared, not I, I was always using a field telephone to call in uh, what I had learned because you were in the field. But uh, then G2 would uh, put all this information that was fed to them from different areas into a uh, memo, secret memo, that was going around that showed all the units that were 
opposing you, where the, what towns were involved, where they were bivouacked, where they were here, what uh, did they have any air force left? Did they have any any special forces left? Was there any kind of weapon that you had to look out for? Uh, it was in great detail. It was all spelled out, uh, and uh, so that you had a corps or an army that would consolidate all that information that was in front in front of them, and it was probably uh, one of the more important things that made them make strategic moves mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the field guy was really just, uh, to this day, uh, when we were still in the bivouac area, uh, a day bef actually several days before, uh, it was right around Thanksgiving, as I remember, in, uh, in Belgium, at, at the German, Belgian, or Luxembourg, mm -hmm. the, right before the Battle of the Ball started. And we had somehow uh, picked up a few German prisoners. And several of them mentioned to me that their major concentration around the city of Aachen and Cologne and whatever. And nobody seemed to pay any attention to, uh, uh, was sort of like saying, oh well, there's nothing special. Well, that was this huge concentration. You had probably over 250,000 uh, troops and tanks uh, that were in in the breakthrough, uh, and uh, uh, I almost would have been caught because of the by the because of when we moved, we were moved supposed to be moving north, and I was going south on this highway uh, towards Malmedy, the town of Malmedy, and it became famous because it, some American troops were captured there and they were mowed down by SS troops in the snow. And right near that area is when I realized, when I heard uh, the shooting was just wild going on by artillery and everything else. And I said, we've got to be in the wrong area. I was in a personnel carrier with six other guys and not my driver. And I said, we better turn around. We, we went to the wrong direction. And we hightailed it all back and off to find our units. But those things do happen. Well, we were very lucky because if we had gone maybe another mile, we would have been, we, we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. None of us would be. Anyway, there were, uh, I could tell you about the absolutely huge uh, breakthrough area at St. Lo in France, right in the Normandy area. Uh, where the German concentrations were, and we, that was the area we, that we needed to get, go through to uh, uh, have a, uh, start a large pincer movement uh, in, in France. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, being in, a, in the bocage, in the, in the fields that uh, uh, the, the Normandy that uh, uh, are surrounded by these hedges, the hedgerow fighting. And uh, uh, the way this whole thing started was uh, uh, the first thing was that they used fighter planes uh, to uh, uh, start the, uh, the bombardment. Uh, and uh, uh, I was in a field where the next field over was the headquarters of our uh, engineers uh, battalion. And they had two trucks filled with mines uh, in there. And uh, one of our P-40s flew over. The P-40s was really a, a, a Navy fighter plane. The P-40 had, had used to have 500 pound bombs on each, under each wing strap. And they had a tendency that if they Bank too steeply, the one of the bombs would roll off, and this happened, and right into the engineers field. Well, it killed a whole lot of people, and it was this, it was this huge black cloud that went up, and we thought, uh, I mean, this is like a hundred yards away or two hundred yards away at most. Uh, we thought at the time that. Uh, 
this is going to be a signal for the bombers that are supposed to follow. We knew that 3,600 bombers would fly over and bomb that St. Paul area in front of us. It, it, it is well known that over 400 American troops were killed, including General McNair, who was one of the top. Uh, he and Marshall uh, were probably as close to the top army people uh, in, in the American army. And McNair happened to be an observer at the time in that area. He was among the killed there. Well, they didn't bomb us, but if you are, say, a half mile in back of where they were bombing, or maybe three quarters of a mile, and you're lying on the side of the, the embankment in there and have dug yourself in uh, a little bit, not a deep foxhole, but you're in there. Uh, I was lying on my stomach, and I swear to you, I was going like this, my stomach. I, I was, after a while, I was black and blue. And you know, just being from all this, this bombing was so intense and so huge. 3,600 bombers after the P-40s and, and Mustangs and everything else had done their work uh, in there, strafing or bombing or whatever it is. Uh, these clusters, you see them coming down mm -hmm. uh, right near you and you feel any day now as you're, you know, you, you've had it. It was one, a sight that you never would ever want to see again. I mean, uh, if you picture, there were British and American combination of uh, practically the whole Air Force in Europe was flying over there to soften up that line and then the breakthrough came and we were able to get through and then make this big hook uh, to the Falaise Gap uh, in, uh, in, and close several German armies that were still opposing us in the Normandy area. In the meantime, we were going through practically almost central France on around in, in that way and I don't know, we captured two or three armies, German armies, mm -hmm. that way. And uh, it was probably a, br a brilliant move. Uh, and uh, um, we always felt, most of us, that General Bradley was a real general that was, the, the GI uh, thought that he was not only the most brilliant tactician, but also we got to know him in, in North Africa and Sicily. And so he was kind of, our guy, so to speak, as far as. Uh, but uh, we had our division general, uh, who was later uh, uh, became a corps commander, uh, General Manton Eddy, uh, was also, uh, he was a real disciplinarian, but I think he was also a, a very good tactician. And uh, our division was really at, uh, 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 as being one of the, the uh, experienced divisions, captured the, uh, or cut the entire Cotentin Peninsula. At the bottom of it was Cherbourg. Mm -hmm. We captured the whole German 7th seventh, seventh Army uh, there. And um, many years later, Eddie became a close friend of uh, the general, the Van von Schlieben. Uh, they became close friends later after the war. But, uh, so, you know, it's, uh, as I say, there are so many details that you could, uh, uh, here and there, uh, that come to mind uh, that uh, they're really not anecdotes, they're really, they're the real thing mm -hmm. of what you, you, you go through and the experiences that you have uh, and uh, uh, and uh, in different situations. Uh, and uh, uh, our medics uh, uh, were any number of times in France, uh, in Germany, uh, became obstetricians. German women that were pregnant would come in and, uh, and have their babies delivered by our medical officers. <laughs> Things like that were, as I remember, situations of this kind and uh, no it uh, it was uh, uh, 
and uh, my division has uh, an association uh, in California. Uh, it started several years ago, a library. I call it almost like a Smithsonian or or Library of Congress um, uh, for microfishing. Every every uh, there probably are forty or fifty books that were written by GIs during the war. Uh, some pamphlets uh, uh, and every kind of decorations, um, uh, not our decorations, but captured stuff of every kind, that, uh, uh, documents, uh, uh, anything and everything that you would collect as uh, something worthwhile uh, that is being kept like a, a museum would be kept. I've sent them hundreds and hundreds of photographs of uh, situations. Uh, they have copies of some of this and uh, uh, I had all kinds of documents that were no longer classified that I sent them uh, over there. And uh, uh, we, uh, I would guess now going on five years, uh, have, uh, well, f f back up a minute, um, in 45 in occupation, we started to form an association uh, that would be uh, perpetuated after the war. Mm -hmm. Starting in 1946, we had annual uh, reunions uh, in major cities, mostly originally in, in uh, Washington, in New York, in Philadelphia, Columbus, Ohio, and so on, and gradually we moved out into other parts of the country. Uh, we will have, in August of this year, in Pittsburgh, our 67th reunion, uh, and the veterans will turn over uh, the whole operation of uh, the association to the sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, they already have formed an auxiliary several years ago. And gradually over the years, in the late 40s, early 50s, uh, they formed chapters uh, in different parts of the country. And in 1992, we formed, I mean this, that late, you might say, we formed a Texas Greater Southwest chapter. And uh, at our original meetings in Belton, Texas, uh, we had uh, over 70 veterans there and their wives and uh, I've been president and treasurer of the uh, what is left of us uh, and we in the last eight to ten years we've been meeting uh, at a place called you may know it Summers Mill mm -hmm. uh, yeah at uh, right outside of Belton yeah. outside of Belton in the country there and uh, 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 we meet twice a year, and uh, our last meeting was in April, uh, because there were only three of us left. And uh, uh, a lot of widows, some uh, of the sons and daughters, uh, and uh, uh, that, and uh, people that come from mostly Dallas, Fort Worth, Arlington, Houston, Austin, uh, Waco, uh, that <coughs> have been uh, meeting in there, and I decided to close the chapter. Uh, so we had a meeting overnight. Uh, we have usually a catered dinner, breakfast, and then business meeting uh, there, and uh, uh, we meet, uh, 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 as I say, twice a year. Uh, at their facility. It's a wonderful facility because it's located so centrally that mm. uh, uh, it, it has made a lot of sense. And lo and behold, at the end of the meeting, I said, you know, we're closing this meeting. Everybody raised their hand and said, we'd like to continue this as a friendship group. So we're, I'm arranging for November to meet there again 
and we're continuing it to them. Well, fantastic. So we're, I have to make a bunch of calls to people to to set uh, set up the specifics. You know, whether we're going to have a catered dinner, whether we're going to have barbecue, do our own cooking, and all this kind of stuff. So uh, it. Uh, I said, you know, I'm tired of it. I've been, I've been doing it for so many years. I don't want to do it anymore. Some of the younger people can do it. Well, uh, they say, yes, well, we'll help you. So in August, we're, uh, my three children are coming, my wife and myself, uh, we're all going to, the, to Pittsburgh to a three-day meeting, at which time we're, uh, historically, we're turning over the bylaws and everything else will be turned over to the young, to the to the yeah. younger generation, and because uh, uh, they really, last year in July we met in New Orleans, and I could tell you we had about a hundred attendees, and of the hundred attendees, there were fifteen of us mm. were veterans mm. that were attending the group, and uh, so uh, now there might be some people who still can't come to these things because of their health or, or some or another. So anyway, that's uh, kind of give you a, a, a long, long thumbnail sketch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know I know we want to transition to this. I, I'd ask, in any of your intelligence work, did you hear of any information about the camps or about these sorts of places? Of course, I knew about them yeah. uh, anyway through either relatives or uh, or family members. I knew that I had, we'd lost a number of my father's cousins, and and, uh, uh, and as I say, I I knew that one of my grandmothers uh, had uh, uh, died there, and I knew of a number of people I went to school with when I was. Uh, you know, in Berlin, that uh, uh, and uh, uh, with the exception of those people who fled to Israel with their families, uh, and I always felt in the in thirty two, thirty three, uh, that uh, things looked so ominous to us all. What would happen to us? Would you know? You just don't know what what's in store for us. Uh, and number of families that I was close friends with their children, all moved with their entire families, uh, either, either to France or to England, or some of them actually even went to Argentina, uh, which seemed to be, for some reason or another, the German Germans are enamored with Argentina because uh, for the last hundred years, or maybe less than that, uh, Germany is, is, is just enamored with South America for some reason, and uh, uh, Brazil uh, also. Not just the ones that, as, as, as people that escaped there, but, yes. but uh, long before that. It was interesting to see when, when you had these uh, groups, the reparation groups uh, in Berlin, uh, how many people were not Americans but had come from as far away as Australia, New Zealand, uh, South American countries, uh, Israel, of course, and so you know you had uh, uh, the, the ones that stayed in a European country. Uh, it was a given that they were not vacant, that they were captured, and just a few of them. This lady I told you about in Los Angeles, uh, where uh, her husband for a while was conscripted into the French army that was opposing the German invasion uh, then there, and they were separated. And she, with her daughter, uh, somehow made it over the Pyrenees into Spain. It was a harrowing kind of an experience that some people had uh, that, uh, like that, that uh, were, uh, uh, you know, were escaping uh, Germany. And, uh, I didn't realize, obviously, at the time that my moving in 1936, how lucky I really was mm. to be able to start a whole new life, uh, because we had nothing to, to uh, look forward to in any way, shape, or form. I mean, it was just a dead end for us. It was almost like being snared somewhere, and you, 
you know, you're in a maze and you can't get out. Mm -hmm. I mean, you felt uh, it uh, sooner or later uh, you would be uh, taken away. Uh, and it wasn't that long thereafter. There were, I think, in the mid 30s, there were people who just plain disappeared. Uh, they, uh, uh, and you never heard from them again. Uh, so uh, it was, and <clears throat> to tell you that, that uh, if you were in an apartment building and you look downstairs, and uh, particularly on weekends, and you see thousands and thousands of brown shirts marching, they're always just doing the S I and S S. We're always marching in these huge formations. And you may have seen pictures in Nuremberg where they had 100,000 uniformed people and Hitler speaking to them and this kind of thing. We all saw this, whether it was on the news or, or in pictures or in, actually in person. Uh, and it was frightening because you felt this was a new force. Mm. And uh, uh, I remember uh, going to a wooded area outside of Berlin on my bike that I had. Uh, and I'd love to, you know, being on my own in a way, I'd love to go off somewhere. Uh, and I went, I, I had some sandwiches with me and I went, went off in a, into a wooded area. And lo and behold, uh, on two sides of me were Germans in uniform practicing uh, uh, their, their, with their weapons uh, in there. They were on a, on a maneuver. And I began to realize this was in 19, say, 34, 35, uh, that I saw this. And I thought, what the hell is going on? But it had to be something that they were, that they were uh, doing that was uh, supposedly under the uh, Versailles Treaty not, not supposed to be. It was verboten, you know, so, that was that kind of thing. Anyway, uh, you know, you, you, you think about it as you, uh, your memory comes back on some of these things, some of these uh, minor little incidents that you become aware of. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, and like I say, not even knowing uh, that I had all these relatives from uh, a long period of time in this country who uh, uh, were, uh, uh, by the way, uh, one incident when I was in New York, uh, my uh, so-called uncle, a great uncle, uh, <coughs> took me to another uncle that was uh, not in very good shape. He was, at that time, he was a widower and he lived in an apartment hotel in Midtown Manhattan. And uh, uh, I remembered that when I was three or four years old, that he and his wife had come over t to Germany to, to spend some time with our family at that time. So I knew him, but he would, by this time he had really aged and he was in bed. And he reared up and he said, uh, uh, I went by the name of my, what is now my middle name, Ulrich uh, was my, my really name, but I took my father's name, Herbert, because he, he raised up and he said, that name is too damn German, you got to change it when you're living in this country. So I said, yes, I will. So I said, well, I turned to my great uncle and I said, no, I'm going to have to arrange to get my name changed to Herbert. But you know, my her, Herbert U. Stern. People ask me, what does U stand for? And I usually tell them useless. <laughs> or, or Ulysses, something like that. But uh, actually, uh, you know, in a lot of places around here, uh, or in Austin County, where we've got a place, the name Ulrich is not at all unusual. Yes. There are a lot of German settlers, Czech and German settlers, uh, and and, and uh, uh, over here in, in Austin County, where we got a uh, place there. So it's just, uh, 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 I, uh, uh, I don't like even like the name at all anyway, so. Uh, you were glad to be rid of it. I'm glad to be rid of it. Uh, anyway, uh, 
if we, if I could read this thing. Please. Uh, please. I will, uh, this is what I sent to, uh, to uh, P Peter Berkowitz for the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. Uh, the capture of Nordhausen concentration ca a slave labor camp, April 1945. Uh, to the best of my recollection, the American First Army and its Seventh Corps had no specific plans to liberate the Nordhausen slaver, slave labor camp. For historic purposes, the events in which I was involved and will describe took place during the period of April 11th to April 14th, 1945. In parenthesis, President Roosevelt died on April 12th, 1945. I was a member of the 9th Infantry Division and assigned to the G2 section of the division. Since I spoke German and French, I was born in Berlin, Germany and lived there until age 16. I escaped from Germany in 1936 and came to the U.S. to live with distant relatives in Cincinnati, Ohio. Much of my work in the division was in interrogation, doc document interpretation, and in liaison assignments with battalion, S battalion S2s, medical field personnel, engineers, etc. Some of these assignments were in forward combat areas, in parenthesis, I was twice wounded in combat, close parenthesis, in specific instances there were contacts with resistance fighters in Normandy, and at times I was on detached service in Tunisia and Algeria with native Goumiers under the command of the Free French Forces, uh, it's actually uh, also called Corps Franc d'Afrique. Uh, between April 11th and April 12th, 1945, we were clearing pockets of resistance in the Ruhr industrial areas. At one point, an estimated 30,000 German soldiers surrendered to us. Surrendered to us. Uh, the newest assignment was to start a 150-mile motor march to the Hartz Nordhausen area. In this area, remnants of the 11th SS Panzer Army was bottled up, refusing to surrender. German High Command had also formed three new divisions. They too were among the holdouts. Two elite divisions began facing the 9th, meaning the 9th Division. The Hartz Mountains had few equals for national fortifications. Approximately 22 miles across and 68 miles long, up to 4,000 feet. Excellent observation posts. Unquestionably, the Hitler government chose this area to become a highly industrialized enterprise. According to my recollection, the First Army planned to bypass the Hartz Mountain Fortress, then encircle the area. The reduction of this pocket constituted the last major obstacle facing the Seventh Corps of which we were a part. As we were motoring, mostly in two and a half ton trucks, towards the town of Nordhausen, we came upon a railroad yard and saw on flat cars, fins and other large components of V2 rockets. Approximately a quarter mile from the railroad yard was a well camouflaged entrance to a mountain tunnel. Inside uh, the tunnel were rows of highly placed electrical lights. We could also see small gauge railroad tracks, long steel tables, some benches, scattered chains, and other unidentified paraphernalia. There were no signs of human beings inside the tunnel. I recall that we walked about 400, 500 to 500 yards to the slave labor camp, coming face to face with one of Germany's most notorious concentration camps. The carnage and horror had been uncovered earlier that day by tankers of the 3rd Armored Division and infantrymen of the 104th Division. Here the living and dead were lying side by side. The living were too emaciated to move their limbs. The dead uh, were unburied or half buried. SS troops 
uh, had stacked bodies in ditches. The stench was unbelievable. Many of us threw up. Yet we took photos with newly acquired cameras. Parenthesis, while fighting in the Ruhr, we uncovered a German aqua plant with large inventories of new cameras, tripods, and lenses. We learned that one group, which could not walk, had been chained in the mountain tunnel for three months without seeing daylight. I also spotted a bank of very large ovens on the premises. There was no doubt that camp personnel uh, burned the dead in these uh, ovens on the grates. Uh, you could see bones. I recall that we commandeered the mayor of nearby Nordhausen to round up able-bodied men to dig additional long trenches to bury the skeletal bodies. I also remember that uh, several towns people exclaimed that they knew nothing about the slave labor camp. This infuriated us even more at the time. In due time, we learned that Nordhausen had a long drawn, drawn out system of torture. One method was to crowd several hundred prisoners into a courtyard. There on a raised platform, the condemned were hanged. Others were taken to the mountain t tunnel, chained to workbenches and worked to death or beaten to death. Uh, they were there to assemble parts of the V-2 rockets. Almost all prisoners were simply starved to death. It is of course well known that the British Royal Air Force in 1942 bombed the original V-2 rocket assembly and launch facilities in Peenemünde on the Baltic Sea. The entire program was obviously moved to the Harch Mountains. The prisoners of this notorious camp were French, Russian, Poles, Lithuanians, Romanians. I'm not certain that any Jews were at that camp. Somewhat later, I learned that U.S. field hospital facilities were temporarily stationed at the camp to minister to those who were still alive and could be treated there. Considering that we had been through eight major campaigns in combat, 1942 to, through 1945, uh, Nordhausen uh, slave labor camp was the most traumatic experience we encountered. Uh, since it took place during the same period in April 1945, Again, for historical purposes, I want to mention that units of our 47th Infantry Regiment came upon a case castle in Dagen Dagenerhausen, a few miles from Nordhausen, and uncovered the archives of German Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 1929 through 1942. Included was the entire library of the German of the Berlin Academy of Arts intact. I'm sure that numerous GIs took photos during this period. It would be difficult to establish where they may be. At the time, I accompanied several of our medical officers and S2 officers of one of the battalions of the 47th Infantry Regiment, all part of the 9th Infantry Division. We were at the camp for about five to six hours, and two days later, we linked up with the Russian tank forces on the Elbe River. So that you you have all of that as a copy uh, of uh, what I've written up. I mean, this was all from memory that I, uh, when he asked me uh, here uh, earlier in the year uh, if I would, uh, uh, with the with pho photographs I had, mm -hmm. uh, if I would write this up for him. Uh, can I ask you a couple of questions about, uh, one of the things you say in there that you said despite the eight major campaigns that you had been through, it was the most traumatic experience. Can you talk a little bit why? Well, uh, and we go back to what my interview was with Leela Levinson and this young lady uh, that uh, she brought along with her, uh, that uh, uh, I think she seemed to feel that uh, uh, possibly, I'm thinking this, but the way she kept asking me the question, 
was that this had to be uh, so traumatic for me and for uh, other people there that uh, seeing this uh, that uh, uh, it was not not anything like anything else. I said, well, I think you. I don't know whether you could put yourself in my own mind in this. We had been in combat for three years. Yeah. Uh, the kind of things that you see, <coughs> people blown up in front of you. Uh, I still to this day on occasions have a vision of a, again about P-40 that uh, dropped a bomb and uh, obviously uh, not intentionally, uh, right near our division headquarters in France. And a guy right in front of me, not more than is uh, as far as you are from me uh, here, the guy that I knew was in the MPs, uh, his whole face was gone all of a sudden, right in front of me. Uh, and he kept walking. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's the, when you're in shock, you, you keep, some, somehow bodies keep moving, you see that. I've seen pictures of, uh, uh, pictures, I've seen people who, uh, uh, when the bridge over the Rhine collapsed, the whole girders fell on them. And I've seen people with their arms, you know, you see all, all this stuff out there. I mean, you, you see so much, uh, so many different, uh, the devastation, uh, the bombing of uh, whether it's buildings or whatever it is. You, you, uh, you, um, I remember being in a field in France and you hear of a railroad gun that's going off. You don't know whether it's hitting you in your area or what. Um, uh, like I say, you, yes, in some ways you get numb, but at the same time, you, you're constantly like this. You're just on your guard. You're, you are, uh, uh, you never know whether from day to day you're going to be hit or not hit, or whether you're still alive and so on. And seeing this was, in some sense, been there, seen that. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the things. So this was, yes, it was a terrible shock, but at the same time, uh, it, uh, you, you, in, in a sense, you almost felt more, you, you can't believe the stench uh, of human beings. Uh, again, we were, in some sense, we were attuned to it. We would s set up overnight, dig f foxholes within, say, as far away as this wall of dead cows, all bloated up, and you cannot imagine the smell, whatever it is. So you, uh, I'm not saying anything that you'd come blasé about any of it, not not at all, but she couldn't understand this. Yeah, well, you'd, you'd see A lot so of these much. people, that were this, yeah. this uh, tank unit and the, and the 104th Division that were, came there before us, these were units just like in Dachau and Buchenwald, whatever it is, that hadn't been in combat very long. Uh, there were so many people, I couldn't put myself in that position because uh, how few units were still around after two or three years. Yeah. Uh, these divisions turned over. I mean, the replacements that we have uh, are, you know, when somebody says to me, I came into, into the division in Hurtgen Forest or in France, whatever it is, and uh, you say to yourself, you haven't seen anything yet. Uh, you know, I mean, the turnover was enormous. Mm -hmm. And people coming direct from the United States, right into combat, no experience whatsoever, and two days later they're dead. Uh, it happened over and over again. So you always had to have, you know, uh, somebody around. The, you know, we, People don't know uh, how many times we starved. We didn't have food or a little C ration or K ration that they that they had with us, and it was gone in no time at all, and it was dreadful. Or, or this these canned spam uh, and stuff like that, and how sickening it was. Uh, in Sicily, in a t outside of a town called Cefalu, uh, uh, we. Uh, we were bivouacked in uh, in a grape orchard, and uh, the, the grapes were 
to be made into Marsala wine. And uh, you were lying there in these in these ditches between rows and rows of grapes uh, in there. And you reached out for them, uh, and after two days, you never wanted to see any grapes again. You never in your life wanted to see any grapes again. I mean, it was just, you got so sick and tired of it. And so that if a farmer or anybody would bring you something uh, to eat, or you found some eggs that uh, you could fry or cook or whatever it is, uh, or anything unusual, uh, it was just, it was heaven. It was just heaven. In Port Leote, uh, now keep in mind, we, we landed on November the 8th, uh, so around Thanksgiving time, somehow or another, our kitchen units uh, got a hold of a great big sow and killed that sow and they built a pit. And for all day long, they rotated that damn thing. And uh, I remember at night, somebody had gotten some bread in town that were these big round ro loaves of bread. And we had these, this bread with nothing on it whatsoever. And they sliced this up. It was, it was like going to a the most famous French restaurant you ever could imagine. I mean, you know, people, little things like this were just uh, unusual. So. It's a lot of the little things that you encounter and uh, that uh, you uh, you can remember. Uh, but uh, again, going back to what your question was, uh, I could to this day uh, remember that uh, our uh, reaction was, yes, a tremendous lot of shock uh, at the same time really not all that much different. And I mean, it wasn't the kind of a thing that caused her father, mm -hmm. after he administered to, to, to them. Uh, you know, whether you're a doctor or whatever, in given situations that are that traumatic, I suppose it could happen. I mean, I don't want to be, be uh, ever feel that, uh, or anybody uh, feel that, I looked down upon anybody that had that kind of reaction. Sure. Sure. Uh, I tell you that we, uh, back in the days long before you had uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, stuff like that, we had people uh, in these so-called hospital tents that were the, the field areas, put them on a cot, give them what we used to call blue heaven pills. They were sodium pentothal. And they slept for 36 hours. And then the doctors would say, now you're, you know, you're ready for, go back in combat. Um, I, don't, I couldn't tell you how many people. There was, isn't anybody, that, if you saw, when we go to Summers Mill t today, that every car has a Purple Heart license plate on mm -hmm. it. Uh, there's anybody that I know, that I know personally, that have been wounded at least twice, many more than that, and some of them, pretty severely and come back. Uh, so it's not that terribly different than these rotations that they have in Afghanistan and Iraq that you had. You go back. And, and of course the motivation was very different. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there were one specific instance that I think would illustrate what I'm talking about. There were two brothers that were, uh, their parents were from Italy. They looked like, I mean, the epitome of the Mafia, both of them. One brother was killed in France. The other brother went berserk. He went into the German lines with the bayonet and just killed as many as, as he possibly could. There's a guy in Arlington, he's been dead now five years, uh, who was in one of the outfits that I was with, uh, and uh, he was from uh, uh, Rhinebeck, New York, up, upstate New York, uh, and his father and he were masons, stone masons, a great big guy, and uh, uh, I would say for the most part, he was not one of the nicest guys that anybody would want to meet. He was always, uh, he 
on board ship going to Africa, he was a mess sergeant, and all of a sudden they made him a first sergeant. Now, in North Africa, he found himself on one of these mesas, uh, because that's what they had. You, you had these dried streams, and then you had these mesas. He was on top of them, and he was surrounded by a hundred, hundred uh, Germans. Uh, and he was with one or two other people there. And uh, uh, I call him Sergeant York. I mean, he killed a mm -hmm. hundred Germans around there. And uh, uh, he was highly decorated. This guy uh, has a room, uh, I mean, his wife still lives there. Uh, John Miller was his name. John Miller has a room in his house, it's like a study. You would think it's a war room. I mean, he he's never could stay away from it. He stayed in the army, uh, both in, in France and, and all over Europe, uh, and eventually came back and he was in the reserves. and. He stayed in it, uh, and uh, uh, when he was made in charge, uh, by the way, he started our chapter, uh, and when he was in charge of a uh, one of our reunions, whatever it is, he acted like he was the first sergeant in the army. I mean, he uh, told everybody what to do and how to do it, and, and it was sort of like saying, don't argue with me, you know, that kind of thing. So. Uh, I, uh, uh, I, at one time I told him, get over it, and he said to me, it was like people like that, that bluffer, uh, that uh, uh, you shouldn't talk to me like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, some, some uh, uh, you can imagine uh, over a period of, uh, three and a half or four years uh, of the kind of things that you encounter and I think if you keep your eyes and ears open uh, of uh, uh, I was probably the, the only one or maybe one of two other people that had a college education number one that came from a background totally different mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, you know, I, I had to have people help me at first to make my bed in the proper way to have bed inspection, that kind of thing, because I'd never, you know, uh, in my household it never happened, <laughs> this kind of thing. So it, what I'm talking about is, is uh, I guess I really came from a somewhat different background. You then at the same time, yeah. I mean, you still learn the language yeah. or, or having had so many uh, really traumatic experiences mm -hmm. uh, coming to a new country, adjusting myself to people I'd never seen before, or, or living with them and uh, uh, going to school in different areas. Yeah. Uh, it's difficult to, to uh, describe that and picture it because uh, uh, you're living in a constant adjustment period, mm -hmm. constant uh, different kinds. And you know, as you were talking and thinking about um, your response or you know what you thought of what you saw I mean you also had the unusual experience that Nazi injustice you weren't surprised that there was Nazi injustice not at that, all yeah. and uh, you know and I think people thought uh, that uh, in the service that knew my background only some of it anyway uh, that uh, how would I react to uh, what I was doing uh, and uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, in many ways, I found myself acting or reacting in no different way than American soldiers around me, my buddies all around me. I mean, they felt, uh, they knew, you know, what I was, uh, what my background was, because if you're, you're uh, close and personal with a hell of a lot of people, uh, these companies were made up of 182 some odd people per, mm -hmm. per company. You know, that's a lot of people and uh, you lose some and you have some replacements and you, uh, you uh, uh, live together uh, on the same in danger and in nice situations, whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, you never even think about, about getting home 
for going home by yeah. thinking about it because you just feel, how long is this going to go on? Yeah. Yeah. And when you finally are through with it all, uh, you're numb. You're just numb. You just don't feel anything. My wife will tell you that when uh, she was on a co-op job from college in Washington, D.C. at the time, and uh, her father and uh, uh, my surrogate mother, that's another story, were living in Washington, D.C. at the time, and they were sitting around, was it honey, was it on a porch or on a yeah, living room? Yeah, it was on room? one of those metal gliders. Yeah. And uh, a plane went over, and I just reacted, I almost medically slid halfway under the under this couch well, or whatever it was. You couldn't get yeah. under it, but you drove it. Uh, it was just a natural reaction that, uh, that you had. Uh, you just got up and tried to crawl under something that was impossible. I thought to him, what is he? It took me a minute to figure it out. I thought, what is wrong with Honey, do you want to ask these gentlemen if they would like something? Well, I would. Right? I would. I was just waiting for some sign. Yes, sir, I had a couple more questions yeah. I wanted to ask you, in particular about Nordhausen. And one of the things that you mentioned uh, when you read, you read the piece you wrote was this issue of local knowledge of the camps, uh, the citizens in the nearby town, their, mm -hmm. their knowledge of the camps. And if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, you would, uh, almost everywhere uh, you went, you would ask, <coughs> people uh, in, the, in these communities, uh, what they, you know, whether they knew that places like this, especially where there were some, some very uh, unusual things that were going on, especially in a camp like that where the town is, is less than two miles away, I mean, within walking distance, and they claim, uh, we never knew this place was, existed. Well, this was just a plain defense mechanism just to say, we're not involved in this. We didn't know anything about that this existed. Uh, you found that in the German army a whole lot, you know. And in this comment that a guy makes when I'm at my old apartment in Berlin, of saying uh, my best friends are Jew Jewish, you know, as if to say he didn't have to say anything to me. Uh, he could have said something about is this place the same as you remembered it when you were a small child or something like that. No. Uh, they have this built-in, uh, uh, and this is almost like a trait uh, on, on the part of uh, the Germans that throughout, whether in the service, in the army, or, uh, or uh, in civilian life, that I found was uh, uh, kind of thing, we're not involved in this, we, we just, uh, uh, no, you were just wonderful people that just obeyed the guy at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, I think the interesting thing to me was that our own people who were Americans, not like me uh, at the time, I mean I, I knew what was going on, I knew what they were saying, but our guys knew exactly what was happening too. And they were at the same time just infuriated for the most part, and saying, these SOBs don't know what's going on? Well, don't tell me that. Mm. You know, that just, I think it made everybody, uh, even their reaction was uh, just anger uh, at that feeling. Mm. Uh, it, it seemed wherever you went uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, they, uh, whether soldiers uh, or uh, 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 in combat areas or civilians, uh, they, uh, I think, uh, an interesting thing happened. We were going through the secret line, and lo and behold, we come upon a lot of wooded areas, hilly wooded areas. Um, and uh, we uh, happened on a Beautiful, absolutely beautiful, big mansion, uh, a uh, uh, hunter's lodge, so to speak, but very, very fancy. And we just walked in. There was nobody around at the time, and I saw all these paintings and beautiful 
uh, 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 frames uh, on them and uh, uh, deer heads uh, uh, all over the place. It was a typical hunting lodge, but it was very fancy with Persian rugs and all this kind of in a very remote wooded area uh, around there. And all of a sudden, this guy who was very distinguished looking in a hunting uniform, white haired, tall guy, comes up and talks to my company commander. And I said to, to the company commander at the time, I said, you know, this could be an area where we could set up headquarters here, uh, even if it's just, you know, for a night or two nights or whatever it is. And uh, uh, he said, no, I, I'm not going to ask him about that. I said, you mean to see it? Well, we're supposed to stay in overnights here on the ground or in foxholes, whatever it is, where we tell this for bitch that we, we're going to stay in your place and we're going to take it over. No, I mean, uh, I remember this because I was furious because I thought to myself, this arrogant token son of a bitch was apparently, you know, this is my place, you know, you don't come, off, come in here. We could tell him what we wanted to do instead of him telling us. So it was a, a, a different incident that we had. For the most part, people were scared to death. Uh, they uh, were, uh, I mean, civilians for the most part. They were very servile uh, in many, uh, many respects. And I think that uh, uh, the comment uh, or the comments by uh, the mayor and uh, people that were in some capa governmental capacity in that little town of Dorkhausen, uh, they were the ones that you know we talked to, and uh, uh, oh, we didn't know any of this place was this wasn't here. It professed not only ignorance but uh, that any kind of horror. They just went about their business like somebody looking the other way, and, you know, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But we uh, said to him, you're going to take able-bodied people from your town, and we want it right now, and, we, and your shovels that you have available to you, and you start digging these trenches. Mm -hmm. And that was it at that, at that particular time. So uh, I think uh, uh, at that point, most of us, uh, were, uh, and not just myself, but many of us in our outfits, were so attuned to their way of thinking and the way they reacted that, uh, uh, were that our guys were, in a way, much more sophisticated than I realized that, that they were. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, you, uh, I thought, was I very different from the rest of our guys who were Americans, and I had been brought up in a different country that not only threw me out but was uh, intent on killing all of us. Uh, anyway, that that I would feel different. Uh, they didn't. They felt pretty much the same as, as we did, because I think that uh, whether it's in combat or in in uh, uh, general feeling about what the Nazis were doing to us, and that we were really basically defending uh, our country, our way of life, and I mean like that, and I think they uh, they felt as strongly for the most part. Oh, there may be a few people who, uh, you know, to them it was a day-to-day -day way of life and really didn't matter, uh, that uh, uh, were, I mean, we had our share of guys who were Virginia farmers or, or uh, uh, you know, Pennsylvania, uh, farm people, or <clears throat> we had people who were in the fire department of some little town in upstate New York, and it, it, see, everybody from all walks of life, really, just uh, were mingled together in, uh, uh, in uh, there were people who uh, were truck drivers in civilian life, and uh, uh, <clears throat> they were, the motor pool was always uh, guys that were mechanics, you know, something like that. So you had truly a mixture of everything. I've meant, I didn't mention to you earlier that when we first came into the Ninth Division, there were people that 
because of the Depression, found that the Army was the only thing. They had been in it since the late 30s. And you know that most of them had been in the CCC uh, and the Conservation Corps, and uh, so they knew that kind of life. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was in itself an, ex an experience and, a, and a, uh, uh, something of having people that, uh, uh, you know, the hangover from the Depression uh, was all over. And I experienced it when I came over in 1936, mind you. So the, the, the remnants uh, of the way people lived, the way people thought about money, and the way people thought about jobs, and their, your entire life was still uh, very much in, I mean, you sense that, uh, was very much of uh, not a recovery, but a coming slowly out of a terrible, terrible situation. And I sense that very much so because uh, <coughs> in Germany we were too preoccupied with, uh, with uh, uh, what was happening to us mm -hmm. and what would our life be like that we, uh, you didn't have that intuition or that feeling that, we, that uh, you felt. Uh, when my uh, great uncle's wife took me around New York for a whole week to museums and, uh, and Radio City Music Hall and, and all over the place, you didn't pay anything. There were no admission to anything. You were, was, everything was free. So it was, uh, and compared to what, not necessarily now, but the last 10, 20 years, uh, these cities were uh, drab as anything you've ever seen. Every you just looked, everything looked drab. Uh, and uh, uh, in 1937, we had a terrible flood. The Ohio River was flooded up and down the whole from uh, Louisville was half underwater. This uh, you, uh, the downtown of of Cincinnati, which was actually built fairly, fairly high up, uh, was all underwater. I worked for the Red Cross. Uh, those of us who were in high school, we worked for the Red Cross most of the time. And we had, for a whole week, uh, we had no water, no electricity in our, in our homes. So we uh, went about our business smelling a little bit. <laughs> we did. We went, we did what we had to do. So I learned a lot of things very quickly. Uh, but, but, but it was a period, when I think back, uh, that took a long, long time to get out of mm -hmm. uh, that terrible period mm -hmm. that uh, uh, we were in. And uh, uh, I, by the way, uh, the house we were married in was a, a, a uh, Kathy here. She's gone. Uh, was a uh, uh, an old brownstone house in the lower part of Manhattan. We were married there, and uh, uh, we uh, um, uh, the uncle that owned the house uh, was one of the uh, brain trusters of the. Uh, of the in the Roosevelt administration, who wrote the a lot of the uh, the uh, original uh, uh, New Deal legislation, a lot of, number of their people, mm. and I met through him, I met through them, then some of the people that uh, were very much involved in writing all the the uh, the uh, legisl mm. legislation. Uh, there was a man by the name of Corcoran, there was a guy by the name of Ben Cohen. Um, they were all uh, the Harvard brain trusters mm -hmm. for the most part and uh, uh, were interesting people, very interesting people. And when I came back from the wars, uh, uh, there were a number of people who uh, had been in the Roosevelt administration that were either distant relatives of mine or were, had, had been working in various capacities, heading certain branches of 
of either or production board or uh, or some uh, uh, legislated uh, units that had been or uh, in some branch uh, of of uh, the administration at the time, and uh, uh, it uh, it was interesting. Did I mention to you that I uh, had an interview with uh, James Reston, the New York Times, after I got home, and I decided that I would not uh, uh, want to become a journalist. Oh, I didn't know you went to see him, but I actually yeah. went to see him. Yeah because my family urged me to, uh, uh, that this would be so interesting for me to, to write uh, war stories. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought to myself, I don't know, the future doesn't look uh, really very really bright in journalism. I, I just felt uh, <laughs> that uh, having been exposed in college to some journalism, I thought that was, was not exactly, uh, was more like being a gypsy. <laughs> 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 than having a real job, so whatever it was. Uh, I'd like to ask, um, again in your description of Nordhausen, you talk about spending five to six hours in the camp itself. Yeah. Uh, can you give me a little more of a description of what you did during that time and interactions you may have had? Actually, uh, we, I suppose in a sense you could say having a lot of freedom. Uh, we were there, uh, and uh, uh, there was no combat situation at that particular time. I hate to say it that way, but in some way we were sightseeing. It was more suddenly you come upon this thing, and uh, we were concentrating more on taking pictures, like one of them had taken these ovens, pictures of these ovens, and you climbed over and all along with it. You watched these people dig these trenches. Uh, you told some of them, you know, what they should do. But I recall it just uh, was almost like a flash that you were here, there, because so many things. You were always on the go. Uh, and this was, in a sense, the same way. It was, um, uh, I tried to explain to Mrs. Levinson uh, the same thing. That, you know, I said, you know, we didn't, first of all, we came upon there by accident really. Uh, all of a sudden we see this railroad yard, and as, as one of the pictures, they're not very good, I, I got out of the truck and uh, said, I want to get on, on to climb on that flat car, these little flat cars, and see, uh, reaching up like this and see how high these fins really are. And uh, several other guys did the same thing. And then uh, get back in the trucks, and lo and behold, here, two minutes later, you come upon this tunnel and this big netting around there, and these great big balls that are, that are look like they're made like a knitting, uh, uh, piece of knitting that are stacked up there outside of the tunnel that are apparently part of the rocket that uh, go, uh, what part I still don't know to this point because everything was disassembled. But uh, it was a, uh, uh, and seeing this narrow gauge railroad thing going right into this building, and we went in there first and take a to take a look there. But other than these benches and these chains and other things that you saw there, uh, and it was fascinating to see how these lights were spaced all over the place uh, mm -hmm. in there. Uh, that tunnel was all lit up. I mean, it looked like a factory that had been emptied out completely, and, and then. You walk a little further, and lo and behold, you see all these people lying there on the ground, and we started taking pictures. So, in in a way, uh, cruel as it may sound, it just uh, you know you almost it wasn't a matter of having a bunch of people come at you and saying, "Oh, you know, I'm." None of that happened mm -hmm. because the few people that were alive were virtually dead. And you had people that were dead on the ground and living, barely living, uh, and that's what you were concerned about. And you walked around. There were no barracks. There were no uh, no facilities. If there were barracks, they were had been bombed out because they were in the periphery of the camp. Uh, there were any number of buildings. Some of them are in the pictures that were uh, completely bombed out. Just the structure of 
the steel structure was still standing here and there. So, and then along with it, you were constantly feeling, I'm going to throw up because it's just overwhelming. Uh, stench. And at the same time, it was so quiet. It was just dead, this dead silence. It was like, like a cloud was overhanging everything. You know, it was just eerie, a very eerie feeling of uh, uh, no sounds or anything like that. It was highly unusual in that respect. That I remember, but uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> and then it was a matter of also some of our medical officers apparently did get involved in sorting out and seeing whether somebody was still alive and keeping him uh, gone and having the townspeople take the the dead skeletons for that's what they were people were just skeletal remains of people that were put in these trenches alongside. Mm -hmm. And there are probably even in, in well-known magazines at the time, Life magazine, other places that have pictures of this because sooner or later uh, uh, journalistic people were always accompanying uh, the, the units one way or another and you had pictures, people that took pictures uh, of it. Uh, and uh, uh, I was, you know, was always interested. There were some really well-known people uh, like, uh, like Ernie Pyle was with us on several occasions in North Africa and Sicily and, and, and France and uh, a guy that used to work for Time, Time Life magazine by the name of Wharton Backer who's a famous uh, writer of foreign correspondence. There was some English correspondent, people that worked for the Manchester Guardian and, and the Times and things like that that were going around and uh, my father would send me clippings from English papers where our division was mentioned uh, of some fighting or some some things that uh, he would send me some some uh, uh, I, one thing that I remember I don't know whether I still have it somewhere in my files or not uh, was a cartoon of a Churchill figure talking to a guy in in who looks real drab. And uh, the older man, and uh, he's Churchill saying to him, "You would do me a favor uh, if you kept that date to yourself," meaning the sixth of June. <laughs> it was a, at the time it was really so telling, telling a photograph. I mean, a, of a cartoon. Uh, it uh, was a typical English humor. <laughs> so. Uh, I would say that, again, uh, it wasn't something that you, uh, with everything that was happening to you and what you were doing on a daily basis or weekly basis or whatever, that <coughs> made that experience into something that uh, uh, you have in your memory day and night. I mean, I could see it in front of me, just like I could see uh, a guy that's not any further than you are sitting here, suddenly his whole, mm -hmm. that part of his face is gone all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and all this blood spurting. Uh, or uh, seeing people crushed, uh, not more than 10 feet from you, or something like that, or blown up. And, you know, it's just... Uh, uh, I have to, in a way, I have to laugh when I think to myself uh, that uh, uh, my parents were uh, every night nervous wrecks. They were all with hundreds and thousands of other people going down in the subway, which are quite deep in, in, in London um, anyway, so they were protected. And hearing all these guns go off, and I said, I'm, I'm sleeping for the first time in two years in a bed. These, that is just. <laughs> what fortune do I have to hell with me, whatever happens if a bomb hits or something like that. I'm in that. a bed. <laughs> I'm in a bed. So it just, uh, uh, it, uh, uh, no, you know, a lot of little things that uh, you could think of that, uh, that are really not of any great importance. And, uh, uh, my father would greet me at the train. Uh, 
uh, coming from down from Winchester on, in, into London, and we'd say, uh, uh, my stepmother's name was Annie, and she said, oh, Annie's going to have a roast for you. And she had to pay with all kinds of points, you know, or whatever it was at the time, because uh, <coughs> because she knew the butcher, and you know, you you, you did a little finagling with it, getting getting some really good. She's going to have a roast for you tonight. <laughs> Just the greatest. Those you know, are the good memories. Yeah. Yes, those are that they are. But there are little things like that come to your mind of what uh, uh, what you had. We were. Uh, stationed outside of Winchester, roughly about five miles uh, outside of the town of Winchester. And uh, we were on an estate that had a manor, uh, but where were we stationed? We were, uh, I had a, uh, a room that was for the sta stable boy and, and I was sleeping on, on some sacks uh, that were at straw in it, uh, in a stable room. Uh, and the stable itself was large enough uh, where somebody had built some type of bunks where a lot of our guys were, were living there. And they fortunately had a double-decker bus that shuttled back and forth from this estate uh, to, uh, uh, to take you into town. And they were going even late in the evening. If you had a pass to go into town, whatever it is, in 1967, my wife and I uh, rented a car in London, and we went down to Winchester. And she, I had taken her to a place that was a very famous seafood place in London, and she got violently sick, got food poisoning or whatever it is. And she was in the back seat of the car, moaning and groaning. And we get to uh, uh, this very old inn, and that we on occasions went to, they had a pub and had a little dining room. And as we got our luggage out, uh, the guy that helped us with the luggage, and I said, do you have something like a, a soft drink that has a carbonated soft drink? Oh, you mean a Pepsi? You know, yes, I think that would be wonderful for her to have. Later on, uh, at, in the dining room, she, uh, uh, I, I would ask the waiter, how about a brandy and soda? So she, got better, and I remember we had the the only room, which was on the third floor, in the attic practically, that had a bathtub uh, in, the, in the room, uh, not down the hall, and uh, uh, before you went to breakfast, you turned on the faucet because it was dripping, <laughs> so that by the time you got to that full, you, you had to, so, but the interesting thing was that we had a plaque our division had a plaque in the cathedral, the famous cathedral. And uh, we now have plaques on the Ludendorff Bridge, which was 2011, they had a big ceremony there. Uh, we have a plaque now in the Hurtgen Forest. So the Ninth Division is marked very well, and there are several little towns, Barnville and Normandy and one or two other places that have plaques about the Ninth Division, so we're, we're, we, 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 we've been there. <laughs> so we, uh, no, it's, it's really nice to, uh, uh, to uh, have something that uh, is a real memory, mm -hmm. something that is, is a permanent, or more or less permanent uh, uh, marker of sorts, that we can say that uh, we've had major engagements there or things of that nature too. So it's, it's a, uh, uh, and I think, you know, you, you have a lot of pride mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in being, in a sense, lucky enough to be in, in that kind of a, mm -hmm. in that kind of a unit that you have a lot of pride in. And I think this is why we uh, maintained this kind of an association mm -hmm. that we have uh, and uh, to have uh, a lot of long friendships, and even with a lot of the widows, you know, we see a lot of them. We uh, spend time with them, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, like I say, they're they're these are the kind of times that are very special to us in many ways because it's just like I say it. Uh, 
if anything in my life as as uh, varied as it has been, if that's a that's a word to describe it, uh, it's uh, uh, this has been really the watershed mm -hmm. in my life because I think it uh, it uh, in many ways you feel you've grown up. Uh, you uh, experience something with all the different experiences that I described to you briefly here and there uh, that I've been through uh, in my life. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that we've always held on to, and uh, those of us who are, you know, still alive. I have a uh, uh, friend of mine who I knew socially a little bit. Uh, was a captain in the artillery. In Oxford, he's from Cincinnati, uh, and uh, we correspond. He's ninety, going on ninety-four now, and uh, and uh, he uh, goes to one of the downtown clubs virtually every day and plays bridge, <laughs> and he's still, in, and uh, uh, they've been married even longer than we have because he married just before he went overseas. Uh, and uh, he, you know, we see him at these association meetings, but we write to each other. And uh, uh, on occasions, you mentioned some particular aspect uh, of the division uh, uh, that has happened. One of the horrible things that happened to us that we've had for the past six, seven years, we had the treasurer of our national association um, lives in Maryland near Washington, and. Uh, uh, he was in the engineers. I never knew him in the army. I mean, for the, until we were in the association, and he was always the guy that re arranged for the hotel and 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 where we were staying and all the meals and made all the arrangements for everything, transportation and this and that and the other, whatever. But it turned out that about a year ago, they found that he had not paid any of the bills. Uh, to the hotel, the Sheraton Hotel in Washington, I mean in New Orleans, from last year's national meeting. And the money is not accounted for anywhere. Mm. So he's being under investigation mm. and all kinds of stuff. And you sort of feel the few of us who are left, why would something like this have to happen to us after all the things we've been through that you have a, a guy and apparently, you know, you trusted everybody, there were no bonds. But this guy who was treasurer, there was nothing to uh, have him basically a structured accounting that has to be for somebody like that mm -hmm. in that position. Because yeah. you're dealing with thousands of dollars. Yeah. Fortunately, the, the association has some investments that go back a number of years. Because in some of the meetings that we've had, three day meetings usually, uh, you made a little money on it, and that was put into uh, investments for the most part. But this to have this happen to us at this late stage in our uh, uh, at this is is really something most unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, that is. But you you're still having your Pennsylvania meeting. We are having yeah. a meeting, and uh, the sons and daughters are. Yeah. Just doing a wonderful job. I mean, they are just That's great. a lot of their people are, you know, in business or in professions, and they're people in their forties and fifties, early sixties, and they're vigorous. They are there. They just love to do all this stuff for the old timers, and uh, even the thing of if you're coming there with, in wheelchairs, stuff like that, they push us and they. they <laughs> They do anything and everything for us. That's great. Uh, they are just wonderful, mm -hmm. and uh, can't say enough about them. And it's just a wonderful feeling that that we have so many, including my own kids, uh, that are so intent of, uh, you know, doing things for their for their fathers. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's just a, a wonderful thing. And here, my three kids volunteered and said. We're going to come to that meeting. That's great. That's great. So we're all going. Well, that'll be fun. Anyway, uh, you know, if you have any other questions, uh, let me know. 
Well, I, I think we've done a good job. I know we haven't covered it all. I know you've got more stories. But oh yeah, uh, uh, lots of stories. Uh, I just, in a way, you know, you you go through that period, uh, and in my case, uh, uh, my whole life was what <laughs> kind of a turmoil. <laughs> in a sense, you could could say that. Uh, uh, but there have been some awfully good periods yeah. uh, too, and. Uh, uh, I uh, I think one of the things that I mentioned to you that has nothing to do with the war is just, uh, that uh, this gentleman that I was working with, is, uh, that's the two of us, in a quite successful business. Not only was he, uh, I mean, the integrity that he had, his his reputation was just stellar. I mean, it was just terrific. And you felt that you had a relationship here that was so, so good. Uh, it was 19 years. I didn't realize it until after he was dead. Somebody said, you know that you worked with him for 19 years. Uh, and I said, you know, to go out after 40 or more years in business. Uh, and uh, the tremendous experiences that you had. These were probably the best years of my entire career and uh, uh, and to look back on them as uh, uh, so satisfying. Uh, not only financially but I think uh, in relationships and the, the, the kind of French business friendships that you built uh, with people in some in this part of the country, some very very important businesses mm -hmm. uh, in the energy related businesses that uh, uh, it's meant a lot to me. It's been, it's been a very gratifying thing, uh, and uh, uh, but at the same time, I uh, rebuilt a defunct uh, business uh, when I came here. Competition was. Absolutely fierce, and and uh, uh, the uh, what we call the consumers, the the mills, the foundries. Uh, there were situations that were pretty unsavory in many instances. That were uh, you went into into a business where there had been a competition, had done a lot of payoffs, and, and there were some unsavory things that were going on, and you had to break through a lot of that over a good many years. And uh, uh, there were a lot of headaches and a lot of heartaches mm -hmm. that went into a lot of these years uh, to uh, build them up. And I tell you, uh, as the kind of business that we were in, there were many, many years where I didn't see my kids grow up. My wife was doing a lot of it because I was always gone somewhere all over the country, always traveling. Among other things, I was uh, uh, a, um, uh, I guess, a, uh, a the representative from the Southwest, and, uh, a huge uh, uh, national uh, trade association, where I had to attend meetings uh, in uh, mostly in either Chicago or Washington or whatever it was. In, uh, did a lot of tremendous lot of traveling. Well, just here in the Southwest, uh, in my case, it's almost on a national basis. And like I say, the four years uh, on the West Coast, where I would, uh, 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 you know, come home for a week, long weekend, mm -hmm. uh, maybe every three, four weeks, or something like that, and then be going right out there again. Uh, it. Uh, uh, when I think back, uh, it uh, it took an awful lot out of you mm -hmm. uh, because it was a long, long, a real drag. So, anyway, uh, you know, if you can think of anything else that you uh, pertaining to Nordhausen, but I wanted to particularly explain to you because having had this meeting with Lila, uh, I felt that she was. It surprised me in a way, but at the same time, I think she was apparently very close to her father. Sure, yeah. And I'm sure in some ways that uh, 
his breakdown must have been a, uh, and especially some of the people she interviewed in this book, you could tell that uh, they were, I think, much more so than our guys and myself, mm -hmm. uh, where it stayed with them in such a way that it was a very, very st strong traumatic part of their lives that uh, they that they uh, could think back. Mm -hmm. uh, but it had to be, partly because most everybody she interviewed uh, had very limited combat experience. Yeah. And the length uh, that we were in, uh, I mean, I had no idea how long I would be in the service you know, when I went in, or nor what I would be involved in. Uh, and uh, uh, both for me, mental or even physical standpoint mm -hmm. yeah, that uh, was so uh, severe. So that I think she really, I think she was in some way disappointed that I didn't, uh, you know, well, say to her that this was a, a, a terrible, terrible blow to me to see this. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing your experience the way you experienced it, and that's what I wanted well, to that's, say today. Well, that, it has to be that for me because I just feel uh, that, uh, uh, you know, I told you some per very personal things here about uh, uh, about my life and about uh, uh, my family uh, that uh, uh, I feel is, but at the same time, it is part of my history, sure. part of sure. my life. Yeah. And, it's a long history. It's really. all connected, yeah. It's, it is all connected yeah. in yeah. some ways. And you know, you feel sometimes, how could you survive all this and be halfway normal? That is a great point to end on right there. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Stern, thank you for your time today. Well, uh, Robert wants to thank you as well. I appreciate it uh, in doing it, but as I say, I think to me, in what you're doing, is uh, either from a historic standpoint, and I hope for generations to come, is really something that uh, it's lucky that we are around to be able to, you know, to do this and yeah. to do it in in great detail. Uh, I don't know what other interviews you have, whether they are in that same depth or, or, or length, but uh, I think if it's recorded uh, for future generations, uh, I hope somewhat more in detail and differently, uh, and certainly the media that mm -hmm. is involved allows people to see and not only see and hear uh, what has really gone on because uh, uh, it's, it's just impossible for me to, to understand that there are people around, and lots of them apparently, who uh, will say it never happened. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't have to come from Iran or anything, right here in the United States. Yeah. It, it's just amazing to me, just amazing. Uh, with all the the photos, the accounts, uh, direct accounts, the fact that there are people alive who have been in the camps, yeah. uh, and so on, it's it's amazing to me how some of the people that I've met, uh, although they were very young at the time, uh, what they're what they had gone through, mm -hmm. and. Uh, virtually everybody has lost one or more family member, close family member, mm -hmm. and some of them a whole lot of family members. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's just uh, a, a period that uh, uh, how anybody could possibly even say this never happened. Yeah. It's amazing to me. Yeah, it is. All right. So, anyway, uh, 